Okay, everyone take their seats. We're about to begin the proceedings. God willing. So, no? God willing. Are you okay? We're begin the proceedings. Okay. okay. Willing, whatever it is. Okay. Um, I start by uh, praising God, the compassionate, the merciful. Salamu alaikum. Peace be upon the whole gathering. Marhaba, welcome, and thank you all very much for attending this, what I hope will be a seminal debate between our two respected speakers on the left and the right. That's what it's all about. It's about a debate, and it's about us coming together and being, you know, you know, being true to each other. That's effectively what it's all about, right? Yeah? You're in for that? You're in for that, man? Good. That's great. Tonight's challenging debates... Okay, entitled Islam or Atheism, okay, which makes more sense, uh, is not happening in a vacuum, quantum, no, or otherwise. Uh, it's taking place within the context of a world full of human beings looking for answers. In a world seemingly full of Western promise, a world full of information fueled by the IT age, uh, however, IT and we seem to have failed to adequately answers the, answer the most fundamental of questions about life, our existence itself, which is, of course, the main core area that we're going to be addressing tonight in this uh, auditorium in London here tonight. I remember, you know, spending a large part of my life asking myself, why am I here? Who created me? You know, do I have a purpose? Um, can we be certain about any of these, uh, you know, th these questions? And once, uh, you know, I asked a bishop, uh, what's the purpose of life? And he said to me, go and do a theology degree. <laughs> right, I'm not telling you to go and do a theology degree. I'm asking you to sit here in a debate for two hours with my two honorable guests the over here. was asking a bishop. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> I'll ask you later. <laughs> Well, of course, he didn't know the answer, by the way, right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's another issue. Um, but what, of course, we can do to inform our decisions about this debate tonight is to use our reasoning, to use our minds, to use our intellect, and really to, for us to have an open mindset. Muslim, non-Muslim, Christian, whatever you are, whatever you believe in, we should have an open mindset and really go at this with sincerity. That's really, I'm, I'm, I'm just asking the, I'm asking myself first and foremost, right? Because that, that's tough being an Irish, uh, ex Irish Catholic. Um, ex yes, ex, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I didn't think the Catholic Church allowed divorce. Oh, well, you know, uh, <laughs> that's another story. <laughs> this evening, two major belief systems, if you like, lay claim to the truth of going head to head. No matter which side of the fence that you tend to reside on, okay, um, by the end of the night, that you will be better informed about atheism and about Islam. Hopefully, the world perspectives, the world view of Islam and atheism. That's what it's really all about. Tonight, what, how's, it gonna, how's it gonna hang? Right. Well, we're going to have 25 minutes allotted for both speakers, although I'm told that that's going to change as well, yeah. okay? And then followed by a further 10 minutes of, you know, sort of uh, coming back, and then another three minutes of coming back, although that might change, uh, Professor, right? And after that, there will be, uh, you know, crossfire, and there's going to be no heavy arms to be utilized in this section, uh, both of you, okay? Uh, although I understand the tongue is a lot more vicious than nuclear weapons. But what we're effectively saying after that is that you lovely people will get the opportunity to ask 
questions, as, uh, 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 you know, make observations, hopefully on the topics, right? On the topic that we're talking about, and there will be two minutes closing remarks, a little presentation after that, and we'll all go home, and we've got to be out of here by 10 o'clock. Um, I would urge the audience not to heckle the speakers, to be polite at all times, okay? And, you know, to listen to each other afterwards as well. Don't, uh, we will not want any blood or any fights, okay? <laughs> and I'm sure that you guys, you, you understand why I'm saying that. So today, our first speaker, okay? Has this been agreed upon? No, I was told. Okay, good, okay. <laughs> Wait, you want to go first? No, I don't care. I was will be our, our brother, uh, well, you say brother. He's a brother in humanity. You're my brother in humanity. He's my brother in humanity and in the faith of Islam. Okay. <laughs> okay, fine. It means, it means God is great. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, Hamza Andreas Dorsis, of course, he's actually Greek, not Pakistani. Please, you know, he, he in fact is, uh, you know, you can see he's a little bit Pakistani, but anyway. Um, he's a student of Islamic thought a lecturer, a researcher for the Islamic Education Research Academy. And without further ado, I will call upon him to give his piece. In alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah to proceed respected Professor Kraus, guests, brothers and sisters, friends, relatives. I greet you with the warmest Islamic greetings of peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Which basically means may the peace and blessings of God be upon you all. Today's question, Islam or atheism, which makes more sense? I would argue that if we use our reason, our rational faculties, we will definitely come to the conclusion that Islam makes more sense. And I'm going to use two simple arguments to verify that claim. Argument number one, Islam makes sense of the origins of the universe. Argument number two, Islam makes sense of the nature of the Quranic discourse. So let me go straight to the first argument, that Islam makes sense of the origins of the universe. Now, we all have had the same type of questions, well, most of us anyway. Why does the universe exist? Why is there something rather than nothing? And in response to that question, the grandfather of neo-atheism, Bertrand Russell, said, the universe is just there, and that's all. It's a brute fact. Even in Islamic history, as early as the 8th century, we had philosophical naturalists known as the Dahriya. They held similar views. Now, the implications of these historical opinions is that the universe is eternal. And if the universe is eternal, it implies there is an infinite past. But the question is, can we have an infinite past? Does the infinite make sense in the real world? Now, the assertion that the universe has an infinite past is absolutely irrational. This is because the quantifiable infinite cannot exist in the real world, something our beloved Professor Krauss has also suggested in his book, A Universe from Nothing, on page 71. He says, clearly, the energy of empty space, or anything else for that matter, cannot physically be infinite. So we have to figure out a way to do the calculation to get a finite answer. Now to highlight why the infinity or the infinite doesn't exist, take the following examples into consideration. Imagine we have, for example, an infinite number of Professor Krauses in this room. And if I were to take five Professor Krauses away, how many do we have left? Well, some mathematicians may say, well, we still have an infinite number of Professor Krauses. Logicians will say we have infinity minus five. But what stops me practically removing five Professor Krauses away from this room? Nothing. And if I do, there should be less than infinite, but there isn't, therefore it leads to absurdities and contradictions. Take this other example into, ex into consideration. My distance between, the distance rather between myself and Professor Krauss. We can potentially split this distance into infinite parts, but I can actually traverse the finite distance, which shows, as Aristotle, the Greek philosopher, said that the, the infinite is potential, never actualized. 
And in light of this, mathematicians Kazman and Newman said, the infinite certainly does not exist in the same sense that we say there are fish in the sea. And this leads to our deductive argument. Now for those who don't know, a deductive argument is a conclusion that necessarily follows from its premises. And to deny a valid and sound deductive argument is equivalent of denying reality. So listen to the deductive argument. Number one, an actual infinite cannot exist. Number two, an infinite history of past events is an actual infinite. Therefore, an infinite history of past events cannot exist. Therefore, the universe is finite. Therefore, it had a beginning. Now, this is a deductive argument. But we also have complementary evidence, which I call astrophysical evidence. And I'm not claiming to be a physicist. We have an established, acclaimed academic amongst us, so he could tell us the rest of the story. But what have cosmologists said? They have said, for example, Alexander Vilenkin, in his book, Many Worlds in One, which I believe is a friend of Professor Krauss. He says, with the proof now in place, cosmologists can no longer hide behind the possibility of a past eternal universe. There is no escape. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. And just to note, even Professor Krauss in his book affirms a beginning to the universe. Interestingly, in Islamic thought, this has been discussed at length, and there is a unanimous conclusion that the universe is eternal it began in the finite past, as the polymath, theologian, Ibn Taymiyyah wrote in the 14th century in his book, as safariya so whatever is besides God, it is all makhluk, all created, originated, coming to be after not existing, preceding by its own existence. Now since we have shown that the universe must have a beginning, there are four logical explanations for how the universe began to exist. Number one, it was created via nothing. Number two, it created itself. Number three, it was created by something else that was created. And number four, it was created by something uncreated. So let's discuss these together. Could the universe be created via nothing? Well, first and foremost, what do we mean by nothing? By nothing we mean the absence of something, and in this case, the absence of the universe. Now, why does our definition make sense? This is because we have deductively argued that the universe began, and therefore it was, it was once not there. There was an absence of the universe. This is undeniable due to the deductive nature of the argument. So based on our definition, I think we can conclude that the universe coming into being or existence via nothing is impossible on logical, rational, and I would even argue empirical grounds. You could discuss this mathematically, for example. What is zero plus zero plus zero? It's never going to be three. It's zero. Therefore, the universe could not have come into existence via nothing. As P.J. Zwart in his publication about time explains, if there is anything we can find inconceivable, it is that something could arise from nothing. Let's go to the next option. Could the universe create itself? Well, this implies that the universe was in existence and not in existence at the same time, which is an impossibility. Also, there's a crude example for you to picture in your mind. Ask yourself the question, can your mother give birth to herself? Obviously not. So we know self-creation is an impossibility. So the next option is, could the universe be created by something created? Well, I would argue as an ultimate explanation for how the universe began, this is illogical and irrational. The universe could not be as a result of another universe, for example, or something else that was created because of the absurdity of an infinite regress. Imagine this universe, universe one, being as a result of another universe, universe two, and universe two being as a result of another universe, universe three, and this went on ad infinitum, we would never have the universe today. Hence, the Islamic philosopher and thinker, Dr. Jafar Idris, summarizes this point. He says, there would be no series of actual causes, but only a series of non-existence. The fact, however, is that there are existence around us. Therefore, the ultimate cause must be something other than temporal causes. So I would argue that the final possible explanation, which is the universe was created by something uncreated, is the most rational explanation. And the philosopher Abraham Varghese, in the appendix to Professor Anthony Flew's book, There is a God, explains this conclusion in a simple but forceful way. He writes, Now, clearly, theists and atheists can agree on one thing. If anything exists at all, there must be something preceding it that always existed. How did this eternally existing reality come to be? The answer is that it never came to be. It always existed. Take your pick. 
the God or the universe. Something always existed. And we've argued deductively that the universe began, therefore it couldn't have always existed. Now this doesn't mean God exists. It doesn't mean Allah, Buddha, Jesus, Yahweh exists. Of course not. That's a leap of faith. We leave that to the atheists. The point I'm trying to make here is that if we continue, if we continue with our rational argumentation using our aql, aql meaning intellect in the Arabic language as the Quran, the Quranic discourse says, afala taqilun, do you not use your brains? If we continue using our brains, our mind, we will conclude something quite profound. Number one, that this uncreated creator must be eternal by definition because he's uncreated. Number two, he must be transcendent. As Ibn Taymiyyah, the 14th century philosopher and theologian said, he must be distinct and disjoined from the universe. For example, if I were to create this lectern, do I become the lectern? No. Number three, this uncreated creator must have a will. Because if it's eternal and brought into existence a finite effect that began, like the universe, he must have chose the universe to come into existence. And a choice indicates a will, and a will indicates it can have a relationship with sentient beings in the universe. Number four, it must be powerful. It created the atom, for example. If you split the atom, ask Professor Krauss what happens. Fifth point, it must be perpetually knowing, because if it's eternal and it established laws, like the law of gravity, it implies it's a law giver. So therefore we can make the inference that it's perpetually knowing or perpetually intelligent, because it's eternal and created laws in the universe. Finally, it must be one. If we use the rational principle called Occam's razor, and by the way, many people don't understand Occam's razor, and I think Professor Krauss doesn't understand Occam's razor either when I read his book, but he could debate with me later. Occam's razor is not about physical causes, by the way, which has been misconstrued as a straw man in the Krausian fashion. Basically, Occam's razor is that you must have a simple explanation, but also you must have the most comprehensive, which means what? It actually means that it has has to have greater explanatory scope and explanatory power because it can be complex because it may deal with most of the questions. But concerning this reality about the oneness of the divine, the argument that the creator must be one is simple and far more comprehensive. If you say two or three or four, then it's not simple anymore and it doesn't answer all the questions. In actual fact, it creates far more questions than it answers, such as how do two, three, four causes co-eternally exist? It doesn't make any sense. So I think we've concluded what the Quran concluded 1400 years ago, that there is a creator, he's one, he's unique, and he's transcendent. As the Quran says in the 112th chapter, say, he is God, the one, the unique, God, the eternal, absolute. He begets not, nor was he begotten, and there is nothing like unto him. Now before I move on to my next argument, I really want to have a nuanced discussion, a very nuanced discussion, which means if someone offers to talk to you, you have to talk to them back. And I wasn't offended, but I found it slightly childish when I asked someone in this room for us to have a chat, and you want to have a chat with me, which I think is not very nice. But that's, uh, that's, that's another story. The, and I want to do with some contention so we transcend this kind of what I would call atheist cliches. So what's the first atheist cliche? The first atheist cliche, I call it the Professor Krauss nothing cliche. And if you read his book, you will see that Professor Krauss was a highly acclaimed academic. I mean, I am nothing compared to him. That's true. <laughs> he's right, he's right, he's right. One second. By the way, him making a statement is not an argument. I don't know why you're clapping like someone who's obedient slave. <laughs> One point. Please, please, I have a time to keep. So, in his book, which I really like his book, I like his style, I like his rhetoric, he wrote in his book, A Universe from Nothing, he said that nothing is nothing with italics. And essentially what he's trying to say, he's trying to change the label nothing, which in the English language is a universal negation. But he's saying nothing is actually something, which is a quantum reality. Now this is quite bizarre. And that's why you have to study philosophy, because you need to make conceptual distinctions. For example, imagine I was in the hallway, and I said, you know, I met nobody, and they gave me directions to this room. <laughs> or imagine if I said, for example, yesterday my wife made a great lunch, and it was nothing. You know, nothing tastes great with a bit of whipped cream. I mean, does this make any sense? And Professor Krauss' use of nothing is actually something. He also says in his book in page 80, our universe will then...
turning to the quantum haze from which our own existence may have begun. And his own friend, Alexander Vilenkin, said recently, vacuum is very different from nothing. It's a physical object. But this is irrelevant almost because even Krauss admits in his book that these are speculative and inconclusive conclusions. Because he says, I stress the word could here because we may never have enough empirical information to resolve this question unambiguously. So I do respect what he's trying to do, but you would never take an inductive argument over a deductive one. Only someone intellectually challenged would do that in my humble opinion. The second contention is that things can come into being without any cause. You have a, you have a quantum vacuum, a quantum reality, and there are some summatopic events that appear without no causes. I believe we have a strong defeater to this argument, and it concerns perceptions, and it rests on a Kantian argument. Now, I can order my perception in, in this room. I can see this very handsome young man. I can see the cameraman. I can see the wall. I can also reverse that perception. But if my wife were to start walking down this auditorium, I couldn't help but see her front before I see her back. And I couldn't reverse that perception. Now, the very fact that I know when I can order my perceptions and when I can't, and when I can reverse my perceptions and when I can't, is because we have an innate concept of causal links and causal connections. To reject that based on empiricism or an empirical reality is equivalent and tantamount of actually rejecting the perception itself. It's like shooting yourself in the foot. This is why the philosopher John Cuttingham in his book Rationalism said, but on Kant's argument, we will not be able to recognize the event in the first place unless there were a rule that makes it necessary that the order of our perception should be thus, and not otherwise. In short, the very experience of an external event already presupposes an understanding of causal necessity. So these are the cliches. Let's go to the next argument, which is the nature of the Quran. Now, the Quranic discourse has been described by Eastern and Western scholars as an intrusive and imposing text, which seeks to intrude into the inner dimensions of man. Now, this imposition is positive as the Quran seeks to positively engage with your intellect and with your psychological disposition. And the way the Quran achieves this is by asking questions. And in themselves, do they not see? Talks about the physiological reality, the psychological reality, even referring to things like consciousness. This is why Professor of Philosophy Shabir Akhtar in his book, The Quran and the Secular Mind, A Philosophy of Islam, he describes what the Quran is trying to say with these verses. He says, nature's flawless harmonies and the delights and liabilities of our human environment with its diverse and delicate relationships are invested with religious significance. Created nature is a cryptogram of a reality which transcends it. Nature is a text to be deciphered, evidences accumulating in the material and social worlds and in the horizons jointly point to a hidden immaterial order. And you may think this is quite interesting for a seventh century book, but the Quran goes even further than this. It produces an intellectual challenge for the whole of mankind. The Quran says, وَإِن كُنْتُمْ And if you are in doubt, talking to Krauss, talking to me, talking to everybody, if you doubt this book, which we have sent down to our servant referring to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, upon whom be peace, then bring one chapter like it and call on your witnesses and supporters besides God in kuntum sadiqeen. If you're truthful in this claim. Now this verse is a basis for an array of arguments in the Quranic discourse and we don't have time to talk about all the arguments. Historical arguments, sociological argument, and a whole array of intellectual responses. But one I want to talk about is called the inimitability and the uniqueness concerning the Arabic language in the Quranic discourse, which Islamic theologians and thinkers argue that it is a miracle. Now, before I get into that, we have to now discuss what is a miracle. We have to define what a miracle is. Now, the word itself linguistically comes from the Latin word miraculum, meaning something wonderful. And the traditional Western philosophical definition of a miracle, as summarized by David Hume in his An Inquiry Concerning Human Understanding, he says it's a transgression of natural law. We don't agree with that definition. Because what are natural laws? Natural laws are just inductive generalizations of patterns we perceive in the universe. If something changes from the pattern or is different, then maybe it's part of the pattern. It's just based on induction. What the profound Islamic theologians and thinkers have done, they've redefined what a miracle is based on the Quranic discourse. And they have said that a miracle 
is an event that lies outside the productive capacity of nature, which means when you go to the nature of the event, you exhaust all possible naturalistic explanations. And also, there is no naturalistic causal link between the event and the nature of the event. And this is a far more coherent definition. Let me give an example from the Quran itself. Now, the Quran talks about Moses, Musa, alayhi salam, upon whom be peace, and Pharaoh in the Quran. Moses was told to throw down his wooden staff, and it instantaneously turned into a live snake. Now, this miraculous event, the snake, lies outside the productive capacity of the nature of the event, the wooden staff. Because the chemical makeup of the staff is different to that of the snake. In actual fact, you have to add more stuff to the staff, if that makes sense, stuff to the staff, to be even close of creating a snake, but only the staff was used. So when we exhaust naturalistic explanations, we find there is no causal link between the staff and the snake itself. So this gives us a definition of what a miracle is. Now this applies to the Qur'an's use of the Arabic language because the Qur'an cannot be described as any of the literary forms of the Arabic language which include saja'a, rhyme prose, mursal, straightforward speech, maqama, a combination of metrical and non-metrical speech and the al-bihar, the 16 rhythmical patterns of classical Arabic poetry. Now interestingly, in classical Arabic, every expression falls within the known literary forms of the Arabic language. The Qur'an, however, descopes the Arabic language. And the Qur'an is a miracle from this perspective, because even though it's made up of the Arabic language, there is no causal link between the Arabic language and the Arabic in the Qur'an. This is because when we exhaust the 28 letters, the finite grammatical rules and the finite words, we exhaust them, we cannot produce the unique literary form of the Qur'anic discourse. And interestingly, from a historical and literary perspective, when attempts have been made to produce the like of the literary form of the Qur'anic discourse, they have all failed. As the academic Foster Fitzgerald Arbuthnot, a notable British Orientalist states, and that those several attempts have been made to produce a work equal to it as far as elegant writing is concerned, none have yet succeeded. In this light, brothers, sisters and friends, what we've just discussed can develop into a deductive argument. And listen very carefully. Number one, a miracle is an event that lies outside the productive capacity of nature. In other words, there are no causal links between the event and the nature of the event. Number two, the Qur'an's literary form lies outside the productive capacity of the nature of the Arabic language. Its literary form cannot be logically explained using the Arabic language. Therefore, the Qur'an is a miracle. As Professor Bruce Lawrence from Duke University in his book, The Qur'an, a biography on page number eight said, as tangible signs, Quranic verses are expressive of inexhaustible truth. They signify meaning, laid within meaning, light upon light, miracle after miracle. So we have two key arguments that are based on deduction, not just induction. And to challenge a deductive argument, you have to challenge the premises. And I hope Professor Krauss would do that. So let's go to some contentions. What about Shakespeare? Shakespeare is unique, but this is a very shallow contention. And I even heard this from Dan Barker in our debate in Minnesota. And he didn't do his reading. Basically, Shakespeare is not unique from the perspective of the structural features of language, the literary form. Rather, it's aesthetic reception. The kind of argument we're talking about are the structural features of the Arabic language. And if you look at Shakespeare, he used the iambic pentameter, the trochaic verse, the blank verse. And many English literatures use the same kind of structures. And if you go to the book, The Oxford Dictionary of National Biography, you will see that Shakespeare has been compared to Francis Beaumont, John Fletcher, and other playwrights. So he's not unique or inimitable from the perspective that we're talking about. Finally, the last contention is, but I'm not an Arab. How would I know? Well, we could use another argument called rational deduction. Now, rational deduction is a thinking process where you take a universally accepted statement and from that draw logical conclusions. And no one would deny universally accepted statements from academia or from authorities that are valid and sound and authentic. Because this is the realm of epistemology, the study of belief, and a valid source of knowledge is actually testimony. If you read the works of Professor Cody and Professor Keith Lehrer in the Epistemology of Testimony published by Oxford, you will see it's a grounded argument which we could discuss later. So the authentic and valid testimony concerning the Quran is, no one has been able to challenge the Quran and produce its literary form. If that is true, then we could 
draw logical conclusions without even knowing one letter of the Arabic language. We could say, well, could it be from an Arab? Could it be from a Ar non-Arab? Could it be from Muhammad upon whom be peace? Or is it from the divine reality? We know it couldn't be from an Arab because they all failed, especially the best Arabs at the time. We know it can't be a non-Arab because you have to know Arabic. We know it couldn't be from Muhammad upon whom be peace because all human expression, if you have the blueprint, you can replicate it. Just look at some replicas of Picasso and Monet in art. And therefore, it must be from the divine. So from this perspective, we've dealt with some outdated cliches because I really want a nuanced and frank discussion. I really do. And I hope I do have that with Professor Kras. I respect him dearly. And I like I respect all of you. Obviously, we're going to have a pun here and there, but you know that's the whole point. I couldn't get, couldn't let Kraus get away what he did in the beginning. <laughs> so, from that perspective, I really want him to deal with my premises, and I want him to deal with the deductive argument. And I wish him Godspeed. Thank you. Okay, thank you uh, very much, Hamza Adorsis, for that uh, expressive presentation on the Islamic worldview. Uh, we're now going to be calling upon Professor Lawrence Krauss to come back on that with his presentation, which I don't think is going to last more than 25 minutes, I'm sure of that. But, but just to let you know, uh, some of you who perhaps don't know anything about Professor, uh, he's a renowned uh, cosmologist and a science uh, uh, popularizer, uh, and uh, is the foundation professor in the School of Earth and science, uh, Space Exploration. Uh, a director of the Origins Project at the Arizona State University. He's hailed by Scientific America as being a rare public intellectual. And he's also the author of many, m more than 300 uh, scientific papers and nine uh, publications, books, including the international bestseller, The Physics of Star Trek. And his most uh, recent uh, bestseller entitled uh, A Universe from Nothing, now uh, being translated into 17 languages or more. Uh, Professor Kraus, I call upon you to respond. Well, th first I want to thank the people who invited me, um, who have been very gracious to me, uh, and treated me with more hospitality than I've gotten in many, many times I've talked. So I guess that's Sabia, who I haven't met, and uh, Obeda, who's been taking care of me for the last day or two, and Issa, who I was just working with. And, um, so I do want to thank them tremendously. Uh, they showed me great respect and hospitality, and I, and I, want, to, I want to show them and, and, and you uh, that kind of respect. And, and um, that doesn't mean I respect ideas. Okay, some ideas are ridiculous. And that's perfectly reasonable. In fact, ridiculing ideas is what makes progress. So if I offend some of you, I don't mean to offend you personally. I may offend some of your ideas, but I don't, that doesn't bother me at all. Just as if, just in fact, if you confront my ideas, um, it will lead to a discussion. Um, what does offend me, of course, is offending personal freedom and, and equal rights, and that's one of the reasons why I got upset at the beginning of this um, uh, session. But that's been fixed, and I thank the organizers for that as well, to agreeing to not segregate this room in the 21st century is a great step forward, and I appreciate that. Um, now, you know, I'm really shocked. <laughs> First of all, all of the, I've watched uh, 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 Mr. Sources, right? Sources. My Greek is pretty good. I think. Be gorgeous. Yeah, gorgeous. Well, you are rather gorgeous. <laughs> gorgeous George over here. Um, uh, has all, I, I've watched some of these, and they're always exactly the same. So I thought they'd be different this time. Um, and it always begins with you, and I'm supposed to respond to you. But the, and I will to some extent, but it's hard to respond to nonsense. And in fact, the point of this is not is is not a question, does God exist? It's not, that's not the question. It's atheism or I Islam or atheism, uh, which is more sensible, I think, is what it says, or something like that. Now, I, I was just shocked because, because I thought that you wouldn't bother to try and pretend you knew science, because you don't, and we're gonna go through that in, in real detail. Everything you said is nonsense when it comes to science, so we'll go through, and we'll have a little chat, if that's okay. Of course. Okay, good. Um, and, and so I found it uh, remarkable that you began with that kind of nonsense, and we'll, we'll continue from that. But let me just first begin with the fact that the, um, that the premise of this debate is in some sense inappropriate, um, because it, it suggests two things. First of all, it suggests that Islam is something special, and it isn't. It's not special at all. 
It's one of a thousand religions that have been, or more that have existed since the dawn of humanity, all of which claim divine revelation, all of which claim perfection, all of which contain, uh, proclaim infinite knowledge, uniqueness, beauty, etc. So Islam is just a religion like any other religion. And there's no difference. It's, it's, it proclaims just as the Rig Veda did and Akhenaten in ancient Egypt that the universe had a beginning, nothing special, okay? It, there's, there's absolutely nothing special. So the question is, Islam as one of a thousand religions, all of which make the same claims, but mutually con inconsistent ones. So one of the things we know is, of these thousand religions, they all make mutually inconsistent claims, so they can't all be correct. In fact, at best, one of them can be correct, because they're not, they're not consistent with each other. So that means a priori, just a priori, and I know, you know like that, you like that term instead of a posteriori. I've heard you say that. A priori, Islam has a probability of 0.1% of being correct. Because it's just one of a thousand religions, and one of them is, it, 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 at most is correct. But since they all make the same claims, it's probable that none of them are correct. So, that's, so treating Islam specially is inappropriate. Then atheism is somehow, as has been described as speaker, a belief system. It's not a belief system like, like uh, Islam or Judaism or Christianity or the Norse myths or, 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 or Zeus or Thor or any of the other uh, myths that have been created throughout human history. It's, all it's saying is it's not a belief system. It's saying, you know what? We don't choose to believe that stuff because there's, it's not sensible. So it's not saying we believe X. It's saying well, this, this myth is inconsistent with this myth, or this myth is inconsistent with what we know about the universe, and therefore, it's unlikely to be true. So what atheism is, is just saying, this is unlikely to be true. It's not a belief system. So to compare one versus the other is, of course, false. It's a false premise. It, the first part of the false premise is that, atheism is, uh, is that Islam is special. Not special at all. It's been there. It'll be gone like, or be there as long as other religions. It's, it's just like all the rest. And atheism is not a religion. It's just, in fact, what it is, is could be described as common sense. Okay? What, it, what makes sense? I will, I will think that those things that make sense are likely, and those things that don't make sense are unlikely. In fact, that's what science is all about. Okay, so that, having said that, that there's nothing special about Islam, and there certainly isn't. Let's, let's, um, let's talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about, my intent, by the way, is, uh, the other thing I should say is, debates, I'm an educator. It's, you know, a flaw, but it is what it is. That means I believe in actually trying to illuminate ideas and lead to discussion, critical thinking, and eventually learning things and the increase in knowledge. Debates aren't meant for that. Debates are rhetorical devices for people to go out and perform, make, the, make statements, and then challenge others and try and uh, 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 convince an audience of something. That's not education. So I will talk a little bit about some of this, and then I just want to have a chat. I'm going to use my 25 minutes to have a little chat. I'll take up my time when I could pontificate, as we've heard, and just, and just ask some questions, because I'd actually like to learn uh, some things, okay? And hopefully in the process there'll be some education for both of us. Um, so the first thing I, I, I want to say, however, I want to clear up some misconceptions. This idea of deductive arguments, um, which, which sounds good, is not the way we learn about reality, okay? Deductive arguments just don't work. They lead to irrational actions. In fact, if we discuss what common sense is, what common sense is is taking your beliefs to conform to the evidence of reality so that you will make rational actions. If you force, re if you force your reality to conform to your beliefs, you will make irrational actions. So you can deduce things based on your beliefs, on your a priori beliefs, but you'll have a problem. For example, your a priori belief could be that if you pray to Allah, that you could, walk, you could jump out the fourth story of this uh, window uh, of this building, and you would land safely. Okay, that could be an a priori belief. And in fact, you could deduce based on all your beliefs and all of the evidence that you're a good person and Allah would take care of you, or whatever you want to call it, that, you wouldn't, that you'd be fine. I would take the elevator down and only one of us would be walking at the end. That is not deductive. It's based on empirical evidence. Okay, now, so, so arguing that something doesn't make sense to you is based on the fact that you, uh, the assumption that you know what's sensible in advance. But we don't know what's sensible in advance. 
until we explore the world around us. Our common sense derived from the fact that we evolved on the savanna in Africa to avoid lions, not to understand quantum mechanics, for example. As I've often said, common sense, our, deductive, our deductions might suggest that you cannot be in two places at once. That is crazy. But of course, an electron not only can be, but it is. We, it doesn't make sense because we didn't evolve to know about it. We've learned about it. We force our idea of common sense to change. It's called learning. Some people would rather read an ancient book than learn. And we, this has been a very good evidence of that. For example, to say something is inconceivable just means you can't conceive it. But the great thing about the universe, and the reason that I do science, is that the universe has a much greater imagination than we do. In fact, there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in your philosophy. And that's what's wonderful about the universe. Things that are inconceivable happen all the time. And what, we, what that does is that expands our mind. And expanding our minds to conform to the evidence of reality is common sense. And that's what, when you call atheism, that's what that is. That's just saying, I'm going to accept the evidence of reality, and if something seems like it contradicts the evidence of reality, or is irrational, I should question it. Now, there are a lot of ideas which, which uh, uh, gorgeous George over here, no, Mrs. Short, Short, Sorishish, Sorishish? Zorzis. 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 I've been to Istanbul and I'm trying to learn Turkish, but I said, Zorzis. Mr. Zorzis. Um, it's, it's okay. Um, do you speak ancient Arabic, by the way? I could read and do a bit of grammar. Uh, a bit of grammar. You don't speak it then? No, no. So your presumption that it's beautiful ancient Arabic is just a presumption. You actually don't know what you're talking about. No, it's not. Okay. Okay. I just wanted to ask that question because I can't, don't speak Turkish. I want to see if you spoke Will ancient Arabic. Well, I just want to ask, do you speak ancient Arabic? Yes, I do. Fluently? No, but I do speak it. Uh, okay, but not fluently. Kefahad. <laughs> well, you know what? There's a real language that you don't speak. It's called the language of mathematics. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about this nonsense about infinity. Let's take something physical. Let's draw a circle and draw a diameter. What's the ratio of the distance of the circle to the diameter? Do you know? You're the teacher. Do you know? You're the teacher. I know. I'm asking you a question. No, I want to have I a chat. I don't know anything. <laughs> well, you've demonstrated that, but let's... Let, it's a, you ever heard of pi? Yes, I have, yeah. Oh, do you know what it is? 3.14, first thing you said. How many, how many decimals does it have? Uh, I don't remember. An infinite number? Yes. yes. Okay. So the physical distance of the ratio of a, of a diameter of a circle to its circumference is an infinite number. Yes. What do you know? Now, when we talk about, now, what's amazing to me is you quoted Aristotle as the basis of science. Of course, Aristotle was the one that told us objects fall in proportion to their weight because he actually didn't do the experiment. He deduced it based on what he wanted. Galileo, of course, did the experiment, right? And we know, for, let's do the experiment here in front of you. So this, uh, this, I'm going to take this object and this object. Yes. Aristotle would tell me which would fall first. Will you tell me which would fall first? Guess, okay. if you don't know. Um, the book. Okay. Look, you were right. Great. Okay, good. Why? Because there's um, resistance. Resistance to what? To the paper, right? Okay, exactly. Aristotle didn't know that. Yes, he didn't. Okay. Aristotle also claimed that infinity was impossible because indeed, as you pointed out, the distance from you to me could be divided into a half and then a quarter and then an eighth and then a sixteenth and that's an infinite thing. It makes it impossible. Yes. Well, the thing that Aristotle didn't know how to do, and you don't know how to do, is to sum an infinite series. One plus a half plus a quarter plus an eighth plus a sixteenth adds up to two. Yes. Okay. So that kind of argument that infinity is impossible, it just doesn't make sense mathematically. Infinities do occur. Now, it is true in my book that I said infinite density or infinite energy is a, is a, is a concept that appears to be in, in contradiction with the evidence of, of physics. But that doesn't apply. All inf infinities are impossible. In fact, Space could be infinitely large. There's no, there's no presumption that space isn't infinitely large. It could be. What we now know about physics suggests it probably isn't, but there's no law of physics that says space can't be infinitely large. So this notion that you deduce that infinity is impossible because you don't like it 
It's just not the way the world works. Because infinities happen all the time, whether you like them or not. Not only that, it doesn't lead to irrational, uh, to irrational actions. Mathematicians have a way of dealing with infinity. Yes. We can add infinities. We can, we can take numbers and an infinite series that, for example, the series 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 plus 7 to infinity actually has, in mathematical terms, can have a finite uh, sum. It's minus 112, if you wanted to know. Okay? It may not seem logical to you. It may seem inconceivable to you that the sum of a series of positive terms, each of which is bigger than 1 12th, could end up being minus 1 12th. But the fact that it's inconceivable to you just means you're ignorant. Thank you. Okay. Now, <laughs> this idea that, that, uh, that, that uh, Occam's razor suggests, for, I mean, uh, first of all, Occam's razor is not a principle of science. Okay, it's a, it's a nice idea that you should try for the simplest answer to any question, and physicists try and use that. Sometimes the simplest answer doesn't work. In genomics, for example, it'd be nice if every gene, uh, every, in fact, you talked about more than one cause for an effect, it'd be nice if every gene, every disease was caused by a single gene. One of the reasons that genomics is so difficult is we've discovered there's a complex interaction of genes so that, in fact, we, that there are many separate causes of many, most diseases. There are very few diseases that have a single cause. But in fact, you know what is simpler than the number one? The number zero. Zero is a much simpler reason that there's no cause. Okay, so if you really wanted to apply Occam's razor, in fact, you'd apply no causes. Now, you also use the term causality, which is a term I understand. Uh, you didn't define it. Do you want to define it? I may do. Well, why don't you do it now? I don't want to give you that favor. Oh, I thought we were going to have a chat. Yeah, but I want to have a chat, not a chat. So it's less rhetoric, more connection. No, no, let's have a chat. <laughs> no, I, I think we, we talk about rhetoric. We were talking about the lecture you just gave. I want to have a chat. I'm asking you a question. Do you know what causality means? You use the term. Yes. OK. Well, I mean, I, if you use a term, you should know what it means. Yes, I, okay. I have my you definition, I have my definition. Okay, okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll define, and that's, you know, cause precedes effects. Does that sound good? No, that's the wrong definition. In my okay, opinion. well, one, I'd like to learn what it is. Well, for example, yeah, there's an interesting book about the quantum physics and causality, mm -hmm. and the philosophers and philosophers of science and scientists have disagreed on a specific definition, so they've reduced back to a fundamental definition. No. Let me, let me, do you want to have a chat yeah, or okay, a chat? Good. You, you quoted a book on physics. Yeah, okay. I haven't finished yet. Physicists don't disagree about the definition of causality. Have you presumed your results here? Do you no. really want to connect with me as a no. human being? No, no. But, but, uh, but you've asked me a question, you're okay. answering it for me? You're, I mean, come on. You quoted physicists. Go on. Let me, I said scientists. Okay. Now, which is the same, I agree. Now, so from my limited knowledge, and I do believe it is limited, of course, yeah. Mm -hmm is that the agreement has been on the, is something which produces an effect, which includes, therefore, you can have something called asymmetric spontaneous causality, where the cause exists prior causally, but not prior temporally. So there is a whole prior, range. What's, what's prior causally, not prior temporally? Prior causally means that there is like, they could, I give you an example, the Kantian example was you have an infinite ball that's on an infinite pillow. Mm -hmm. Now, they both, like time doesn't exist here, but you're not going to say that indentation is not as a result of the ball. So there is a causal dependency there, and time is out of the window. So we could discuss causality until the cows come home, but you know it's not as simple as what you're trying to say in terms well, of that. It's, so, it, so it doesn't presume temp uh, temporality. Do you see? Well, I, I think it does. I think when, again, if you think carefully about what you just did, okay. the ball doesn't create an indent a pillow. And by the way, you used infinite. I thought we weren't allowed infinite. But anyway. Um, it was an example. Yeah, well, it's an example of a physical example, which you said doesn't exist. If it's but, but it doesn't matter what's infinite. A pillow here, a finite pillow and a finite ball. Yes, yes. OK, there's an indent. Of course there is. Yeah. OK, was the, ball, was, it, was the ball there or not? Well, my example wasn't based on finitude. It was based on they're both infinite. Well, the, but, the, but, if, but if the ball isn't on the pillow, it doesn't create an indent, right? Yeah, of course, yeah. OK, so it had to be. So was it put on the pillow or not? Well, that's irrelevant. You're damning oh, the well, example. Well, that's a, it's a logical fallacy. No, no, Get no, the point no, I mean, I'm the trying point to say. Is that the physical causes have physical effects. So either the ball is on the pillow or not. Now, the point about causality is that, <laughs> that, that the interesting aspect of it is, is that it's an interesting physical question. But what if there's no before? Let's take, you know, you talked, you, you talked about the cosmology. So let's take general relativity, whose equations I, I, I'm sure you don't know. And, 
and, I said and I don't know anything. Beginning, oh, we talked, you, you made it very clear that the beginning of the universe is very important. You deduced it, but in fact, deduction doesn't matter. The point is, the universe, our visible universe did have a beginning because we can measure it. Whether we liked it or not, or whether we think it's sensible or not, it actually did have a beginning, a cause, not, a, a factor not in dispute. Our universe had a beginning. Now, however, the laws of physics tell us, right now if we extrapolate back to the beginning, that it's quite, that if we took it at face value, that time didn't exist before t equals zero. So if time doesn't exist at all, what's the, what it, the, the sense of cause doesn't even make sense. And this is the key point. In science, we have to realize that our common sense notions sometimes go out the window. When we observe effects, they have causes. But at the beginning of time, when time itself may have come into existence, then that question becomes a bad question. Philosophers can debate it, people can write it down, but it doesn't matter. Now, the other thing I will say is you've somehow talked to me about the fact that the Quran as a literary document is different than other literary documents. And you've given some arguments that I understand. What I actually did this the other day, because I've seen you give this talk a gazillion times. Um, I actually input in a, in a, in a computer uh, 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 a lot of Arabic words and asked them to produce it at random. And I produced uh, two sentences from the Arabic in 11 point, from the Quran in 11.6 seconds. My computer speaks neither Arabic nor is Arab, but produced that incredibly <laughs> divine, those incredibly divine words. Now, and the other question, of course, I would have is, all, and this is a common sense question, is why did God choose Arabic or Aramaic or Greek? I mean, what, you know, doesn't he speak English? Or the Americans always think he does, which is why they invented the Mormon religion. Um, but, and so, so, so the question I want to ask is, what makes sense is to ask not the details of the Koran, which I don't want to dwell on because it's just one of a thousand different religions, all of which make the same claims, and all of which, if you look at them a priori, are equally ridiculous from a a priori common sense notion. For example, and I got this from my, friend, my late friend Christopher Hitchens, is it sensible to assume that humans, humans evolved in their present form somewhere between 250,000 to a million years ago? So you have a god who creates a universe uh, and, and has four and a half billion years of life evolving, and then, and then uh, Homo sapiens evolve and live in incredibly awful conditions and, um, and uh, for 250,000 years, and suddenly, in the middle of the desert, in a cave where no one can see it, he takes some poor schmo and says, I'm going to tell you the truth. And not only that, I'm going to allow you to save humanity. And in fact, if people don't believe you, they're going to go to hell for eternity, and we can talk in great length, in great sadomasochistic length, about the torture they're going to have, and we can all enjoy it. Now, what, what about all those poor 250,000 year, 250, years of people, of real people who were struggling to exist and survive, those poor people who were existing before that God decided to, to uh, uh, give his revelation to Muhammad? Why that? Why would, why would a sensible God wait that long? And of course, the interesting question you have to ask is, why are the revelations always done when no one can see them? If you're, if you're asking a court of law, you'd say, well, you know what? It, it just doesn't make sense. Why doesn't once, why don't once, it doesn't, doesn't call down from the sky so everyone can hear them? Why is it always given to people in private who then claim they've had a revelation? Now, why should I believe Muhammad's revelations any more than anyone else's? In fact, there's a young woman in the United States, in my country, who, as you know, had a revelation. You may know this. She had a revelation. God told her to drown her four children in a bathtub. And she did. Because God told her. She heard it. She heard it. She had a revelation. It was real. She heard words of incredible harmony and beauty that she'd never experienced before in her life. And she drowned her four children. Okay, now she's in a mental hospital, for good reason. Because there's no evidence. There's no, that a sensible person would believe to suggest that God was telling her to drown the four children. Now, why would, do, do, let me ask you, do, you, do you think Sharia law should be instituted? Oh, it depends what, how you define Sharia law. 
Do you know okay. anything about Sharia law? Sir? Well, I was going to ask you about it. I will teach you in the next round. Okay, good. Do you think, for example, that blasphemers should be punished? Blasphemers meaning? Maybe if I say, let's, let's just say, and forgive me, let's just say I say that someone who married a nine-year-old girl is a, is a pedophile. Yeah. And maybe that person is a prophet. Is that a blasphemer? Should that be, is that worth being punished for? Well, I think you should be educated first and foremost. No, no, maybe I'm not saying it happened. But let's say I said that, I made that claim. Should I be punished? In a court of law with justice, there will be a form of punishment, yes. Okay. So if I, what about if I questioned, openly questioned, the existence of God? In fact, said openly and preached in a, in a room that there's no God. Is we, that worth punishment? This is full in our history. We don't have a problem of intellectual debate and dialogue. Okay. I even mentioned the 8th century Dahriya. So, so if I say that Allah is not God, but Thor is God, and people should worship Thor, and I go, and th that it's not blasphemous. Well, it's wrong and it's, and it's okay. childish, but okay. I will have a discussion. But, but it's blasphemous to suggest, is it blasphemous to suggest that Muhammad isn't a prophet? Well, from an Islamic perspective, but you have to understand there's a difference between public intellectual discourse okay, so, and great, being okay. deliberately rude. Okay, well, that's, but that's we're all great. for intellectual discourse okay. as per <laughs> this big debate. Oh, but you say I should be punished if I suggest Muhammad was a child molester. That's no, 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 I wasn't saying that. Did I, well, you say that? What I'm saying is, in an Islamic law, for instance, if you were to speak about something like this, and you would be taken to a court under certain conditions. Then I would be punished. There may be a punishment, but generally speaking, it would be more edifying and educational. But should there be punishment? That's what I'm asking you. Should there be? Oh, you're asking me, you're asking me if there yeah. should be punishment? I think we should follow God's law, of course. So there should be a punishment? I think there should be a punishment if you're deliberately harming for, anyone else. For openly questioning. Well, John Stuart Mill didn't had the same opinion. For openly ridiculing. So, so, no, 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 so no, there's a difference. Don't straw man okay, my let, position. Okay, let me take a more clear example. You're straw manning my Say position. Say you're a homosexual man. Yes. And you have sex with another homosexual man. Is that, should that be subject to punishment? In the private home, it's outside of the Sharia law. If they did it in public, which doesn't even happen where you're from, mm -hmm. then there's a different story. What would the... What would the <laughs> where am I from? Where am I from? Well, you are from the United States of America. Oh, I see. And, and, that's, uh, and so it doesn't even happen in, in where I'm from. Now, that's, that's rude. But in any case, um, how is that it rude? Happen, but it, I thought you were an empiricist. It does happen where I'm All from. All the stats. So two people you know. in Arizona are out in the desert having sex because they really get turned on, yes. and they're both men, yes. and they have sex together. Yes. Okay. Is that punishable? If there's no one in the desert, no, it's not. Is homosexual? Okay, let me ask you another question. Is homosexuality wrong? In the Islamic tradition, it's a sin. Okay. Now here's a, here's an idea of why. Common sense should tell you that Islam, like many other religions, is not common sense. Because, of course, homosexuality is perfectly natural. In all, in all animal species, almost, it's natural. It occurs with a 10% frequency. Okay? In fact, there are good evolutionary reasons for homosexuality. So in that sense, there's no reason and a fundamental... Why would a god who thought it was a sin make it natural among all species? I don't think the sheep by the way, which 10% of sheep are long-term homosexual relationships, okay? <laughs> Why would a god who thought it was a sin create sheep who don't have a soul, who, can't, who aren't able to think about it, be homosexual? That's the kind of nonsense that we have to ask, and the only way we can determine if it's nonsense is by looking at the world around us, not by deducing it, not by listening to the words of ignorant individuals and Iron Age, Iron Age peasants who didn't even know the Earth orbited the sun. Wisdom and learning comes from observing the world around us, and we shouldn't take our wisdom from people who didn't even understand the way the world worked. Thank you. Professor Krauss, thank you very much for your presentation uh, on the atheist worldview. It's not uh, a worldview. I, I, think it was, it. I think it was actually more like a dialogue, nice to chat between you two guys, actually. I, yes. was, I was wondering whether I should jump in and stop you guys, you know. So, uh, anyway, I'm sure, I'm sure Aristotle and Plato did the same thing. But now we've got something uh, to sort of come back on uh, from the professor. He's given a lot of food for thought. And no doubt Hamza, in uh, about 10 minutes, yes, you thank could you. Uh, possibly come back and of answer course. some of those contentions brought up thank by Professor Krauss. Thank you very much, Professor Krauss, audience. First and foremost, I think most of what he said was a red herring. A red herring 
is this very smelly fish that you pull across the path of running dogs. <laughs> and uh, it, it, the reason it was a red herring because he said that I spoke about science. I specifically said he knows better than I do. I specifically didn't use it as my key argument for the finitude of the universe. And he wanted to correct me on something that I didn't even mention myself. This is what you call, not rhetoric, not intellectual arguments, what you call sophistry. It's rhetoric with crap, frankly. <laughs> now, and, and, and I'm, not saying it to be, I'm not saying it to be rude because it's a typical Krausian fashion. A Krausian fashion trying to win over the whole audience, make a hoo-ha in the beginning. And you know, imagine I did that when I walked into, one day I had interfaith dialogue. And imagine I walked into a Jewish mosque or hall that was public and I basically said, I don't want to do things your way, but I want to discuss with you, but I'm not going to do things your way. Is that tolerance? Is that how you connect with other people? He wants to know about our tradition, but he won't even ask them, why do you have this? And he, another straw man, justice and equal rights. You think they're saying that because they don't have any justice or equal rights? My wife is up there, ask my wife. What's the matter with you? See, these presumptions from Fox News, you're an academic, but when you talk about Islam, it's based on the Fox News narrative, and I'm going to expose this in a minute. Now, the first point I want to make... Now, you used the word a priori more than three times, but you rejected deductive thinking. I mean, isn't a priori deductive? I mean, you can't have your cake and eat it, sir. I tried to talk and you left. Th that's the first point. The second point I like to make... Actually, let me calm down. <laughs> the second point I would like to make is that, see, we're not, re we're not rejecting inductive arguments. Of course we're not. You're forgetting the inductive method, the scientific method. Do you know where it came from, sir? Do you know where it came from? I know, in fact, there's a remarkable scientific mathematical tradition in the Arab world that that's what you're going to talk about. I'm going to talk about Ibn al-Haytham, yeah, his book yeah, on optics, sure. yeah. read the works of David Limburg and others, historians of philosophy and science, and they say it came from Islam. You know why? Because Islam doesn't reject... No, they came the, from the Arab world. They didn't come from Islam. Well, let me give you the link. Let me yeah, give you the link. Okay? أَفَلَا يَنْظُرُونَ إِلَى الْإِبِلِ كَيْفَ خُلِقَتْ Have you not seen empiricism, the creative thing like a camel, and how it was formed or how it was created? This was the basis and this was the poetic justification for the entire scientific method. As Muslims, we go where the science takes us. But we're not stupid. Deductive arguments, they are necessarily true. Necessarily true. If you wanted to discuss my argument, you had to break down the premises, which you didn't. You just taught us talking about the infinite and the circle and the sun conference. I knew we were going to do this because it's all mathematics. You remember what I said? No, it's a physical circle. Yeah, but let me make a point. Okay. Let me make a point. I said the quantifiable infinite, the quantifiable infinite cannot be actualized in the physical world, something that you, you agreed with. One second. And I said there's nothing wrong with the qualitative infinite. And qualitative infinites can exist infinitely. For example, mathematicians discuss. Yes, so where's the infinite there? <laughs> That's the length. What's, is, you, just, is, you think this is a length? A length is a physical quantity? That is. Length that is. a physical quantity. That is, yeah. Okay, the length of this and the length of that, okay, the ratio of those two lengths is an infinite number. Yes, of course it is. Okay. But great. what is that length? What is that length? One. This is a length one. It's one kraut. Okay, can you. Ca kraut. One second. Can you measure. Wait, can you measure the straight line? And can you measure the circumference? Yes or no? I can measure it. Well, that's, a quant that's quantifiable. Yes. What you're talking about is in the realm of mathematical realm of discourse, which has axioms and conventions, which makes sense. I'm not disagreeing with that. I'm agreeing with what you already agreed with in your own book, which from a quantifiable, discrete perspective, you can't have an infinite. That's the point I'm trying oh, to make. Discrete. The discrete parts. Then who says it has to be discrete? Oh, but that's your presupposition. That's no, your presupposition. Actually, you brought your assumptions, Fox News, by the way, no, 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 and no, other no. stuff, and you think you've got an answer. No, I, I have time. Let me finish this, please. Okay, because we're yeah. going to teach you different calculus. Newton invented a lot. Yeah, time I know, ago. but okay. calculus is based on axioms and conventions in the mathematical realm of discourse. It describes how things work. Yes. Let, let me make a point. So, that's the first point. Oh, dear. <laughs> okay, then you spoke about. For example, zero is simple as, an, as, as Occam's razor. Again, you've, you've misconstrued what Occam's razor is. Occam's razor is not only the simplest explanation, but it has, has, to, has to have greater explanatory scope and explanatory okay. power. Zero has no explanatory scope of, or power concerning the origins of the universe from I'll, that perspective. I'll explain it how it does. The other point I like, to, I like to make is you spoke about, for example, hell and justice, and look at all these people that are going to hell. Again, 
another huge straw man. You've misrepresented Islamic theology. We have a very nuanced theology, sir. I think the best thing to do, if you were sincere, you would have said, you know, Hamza, I don't get this. I haven't read this before. I'm just making my own up, mind up because I watch videos of Christopher Hitchens and he's an authority to me. I don't know much. Uh, can you tell me what Islam says about this issue? That would have been better, wouldn't it? But again, it's a straw man. And when it comes to things like hell, we believe God is all just and all merciful, okay? No one disagrees with the concept of punishment, okay? You're not going to disagree with the concept of punishment, are you? So when it comes to people who haven't heard about Islam, there's a whole array of theologians like Ibn Taymiyyah and Al-Ghazali who said that there's going to be another form of justice for them. They may be tested on the Day of Judgment based on other prophetic traditions. It's not as simple as that. Okay, homosexuality is a sin. Again, you try to put words in my mouth and... and and that's not nice. That's not nice. I asked you questions. I didn't you did, but I don't know if you try to answer them for me, which is quite interesting. Now, <laughs> see, we you don't believe answer. homosexual tendencies, tendencies per se, are sinful. It's the manifestation of a homosexual act in public is sinful. Because we believe in, in our theology. Let me, make, let me just make the point. That we're given a package. We all have tendencies. Some have, people have tendencies, you know, the, the polygamists, for example, or other people have tendencies that may be seen negative or taboo. Other people have tendencies concerning various different things. So we believe this is a package that God has given us. But we have an empowering philosophy which says that God, okay, when he gives you these tendencies, whatever they are, whatever kind of inclinations we, ha we have, we use our aqad, our intellect, by understanding the divine reality and what he wants from us because God would know me better than I know myself. And he would say, fine, you have these tendencies. This is how you shape them. This is how you control them. Like, we don't believe in, like, we should be agitated purely based on the beastal aspects of man, whether it's heterosexual or homosexual. And by the way, you know, saying off to your mother is equivalent major sin as being a homosexual. So the point I'm trying to say is we don't condemn people per se. We don't say, you know, I'm going to kill you. We appreciate every human being, they have spiritual needs, but we're not going to make up our own religion. We're not going to follow the Krausian religion, whatever he says. We're going to follow the divine reality. If he says homosexuality is a sin, it's a sin. Just like drinking alcohol is a sin for the Muslim. Or for example, being harmful to human beings is a sin. Right? Just because I have a tendency and, and I'm a martial artist and I want to harm people, does that mean now you know, God is wrong just because I have that tendency? I mean, that's, that's not right. Anyway, I'm still looking for some, count, some strong counter-arguments you made to my points. Um, there were no points to actually make any counter-arguments. Well, there were, because you didn't... You, okay, let's just put it Infinity simply. Infinity doesn't exist. Yes, it does. Okay. You didn't? You didn't? No, I said the quantifiable infinite doesn't exist. I agree the infinite exists. Don't... Again, another straw man. The point I'm trying to say is this. We have a deductive argument that the universe is finite. If it's finite, it began to exist. If it began to exist, there are some logical possibilities. Please entertain those logical possibilities. If not, it's equivalent to you coming to my house, having a coffee, I'm talking to you, but you're talking to the window. And I know you have, you, you have better morals and manners than that, because I, I know you're, you're highly respected, and we do all respect you in some paradoxical way. But the point is, <laughs> the point I'm trying to say, uh, Professor Krauss, is that I think it's only fair if you want to pick and choose from the Fox News narrative that you actually try to change that stance and say, right, what does Sharia law say? Do you have a book of Sharia law at home? I asked you so I could learn. No, but you were telling me. Do no, you have a book? You. Okay, do you have a book on Sharia law? No. And because you make it's based judgments. On nonsense. And you be okay. I have a book on atheism. I think it's based on nonsense. Right. But I give you the intellectual epistemic respect to read your worldview. But you've come here, well, blase. Sorry. You've come here, blase. Almost arrogant. I don't want to judge you. And saying, you know, it's all rubbish. I'm not going to take any of his arguments. I know better than you, which you said that. And I do agree in physics, you do. And you've come here making judgments on Sharia law. You don't even have a book on Sharia law. That's why I ask questions. <laughs> And the point is... I'm sorry, that's why I ask questions. I asked you questions so I could learn. I asked what you thought yes. as someone whose opinions I'm supposed to respect. And I wanted to know, yes. did you think it was wrong? And I wanted to know why. There's no sense why homosexuality is wrong. I wanted to know what common sense tells you that homosexuality is wrong, except some self-proclaimed prophet telling you no. with no evidence. There's a different point. Okay. <laughs> okay, let, let, me, let, me, let, me ask, let me ask Professor Krauss a question. Why is, why is incest wrong? It's, uh, it's not clear to me that it's wrong. 
Okay. It's clear to me. It, there's a. There's an. No, no. No, no. Listen. Listen to me. L l listen to me. Wait, wait. Let's give him. Let's okay. give him the respect, please. He's got a justification. You ask me a question, and if you want me to answer, I will. Yeah, of course. Okay. Do it. Okay. okay. The point is, most societies have, tab have a taboo on incest, and and it's an empirical one. Generally, incest produces genetic defects. Yes. Okay. Uh, and so the so in 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 general, there's a physiological reason and a, and a societal one why incest is wrong. Yes. Okay? But if you ask me the question, is it, and this is an interesting question, we are in, by the way, it's an ingrained, there's an in, ingrained incest taboo in almost all societies for that reason. Sure. Because societies want to persist, so it, it works. But if you ask me a priori, for example, the question, if a brother and a sister loved each other and used contraception. Is, is there something absolutely morally wrong about that? I'm, I, and that, by the way, and it was once, and they went off and it didn't affect anything else? I'd have to think about it, because I don't think there's any absolute condemnation of that fact. If they love each other and care for each other, and they go off and it doesn't affect anything else, okay. I, I, would I recommend it? No. Would I be particularly happy about it? But would I, would I be willing to listen to those arguments if they were rational? Maybe. OK, good. So see, this is precisely the point I'm trying to make, Professor Krauss, is that I find it quite interesting. Someone who adopts an atheist position would have strong moral judgments about a religious tradition, whereas your moral judgments, at best, are relative and subjective. Now, when you look about moral theory, from an Islamic perspective and a religious perspective, you see that objective morals, like even pointing the finger and saying, you know, you're wrong, you're nonsense, Sharia law is backward, these kind of strong emotive things, I think we can only be that emotive and strong in an objective sense if you have God as a grounding for your objective moral values. Because if you take God out of the picture, he's the only concept that transcends human subjectivity. Social pressure, you know that doesn't work, look what happened in Nazi Germany. You know, for example, evolution, it, makes it end up being ephemeral and empty. If you look at the philosopher of science, Michael Rules, he said, you think loving thy neighbor as thyself is like you're referring above and beyond yourself. But essentially, it has no true meaning. It's just a product of survival and reproduction. So from this perspective, you don't have an ontological grounding for objective moral truths. The best you could do, what a lot of atheists have done, is, well, we believe in moral re realism, which is moral truths are just moral truths because they are. Well, Islam just is, and the Prophet Muhammad upon him is just is, and the Quran just is. That's not an argument. So the reason I asked you that question, sir, was to say, how on earth, from an intellectual perspective, can we point the finger at religions from a moral perspective? And especially today, has been, the irony is most of your articulation against Islam has had a moral vibe to it, not a rational one, because so. you didn't deal with the premises of my argument. I did. You, no, you didn't. You talked about infinity. And I talked about causality, infinity, the, con the words that you were throwing out. Yes, and what did you say about causality? I said, in fact, that it's quite likely the beginning of the universe causality isn't a good question. But, but if you understood the physics, you understand yeah, though, Your presupposition of causality... No, it's not my presupposition. It is. It's time doesn't exist. Yes. Space doesn't exist. Okay, think about the, the statement, something produces an effect. Mm -hmm. Where is time as a definition there? It produces. No, it could be, equal, it could be, it could be, a, it could be atemporal. What do you mean atemporal? You well, explain to me clearly what you mean in a physical way. And, okay. okay. Don't just give me English uh, language. Give me, give me a physical example. Okay, let me give you, like, like your nothing is a physical example, yeah? yeah. Well, you haven't <laughs> described what my nothing is yet. You, you, you read the preface, like a number of people did, but I don't know if you got very far. In the Actually, book. I read the whole book. I, okay. I liked it. What's my nothing? Your nothing is... What is my nothing? Your nothing is quantum. No. It is. No. No space, no time, no laws, Th no nothing. But that's still a quantum haze. No. No, that is. No, there's no quantum. There's no universe. There's no universe. Nothing. Zero, zip, nada. So why did you say in your own book then that we would reduce to our own quantum haze? Hamza, can I? Yep. Can I? Well, he took interrupt? a lot of my time. He took a lot of my time. Yeah. Well, did you? I took a lot of my time. It's kind of dissolving into question. a discussion. So we'll, we'll, we'll continue the discussion. Oh, I we will do. No, of course. Okay. Yes. okay. Thanks very much, Hamza. Please come and sit down, brother. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to stop you in mid-flow there, but Oops. over to uh, there Professor. Must, there must be some Greek in Professor Krauss. Yeah. <laughs>
Look, okay, well, we can continue the discussion because uh, it should be a discussion. Um, my point is that the question, I repeat again, is what's more sensible? And what's more sensible, ultimately, is what produces more rational action. And I'm sorry, if you talk about tolerance, I get so tired of hearing people talk about tolerance, but then I hear people talking about blasphemers. I should be allowed to blaspheme all I want, because ridicule is an important part of, of, of inquiry and discussion. Sometimes ridicule some, ridiculing something illuminates it. And I hear about blasphemers, I hear, I hate to say it, and this may be a complete misapplication of Islam. It could be that Islam, as it's practiced in many countries in the world, is a misapplication of Islam. But all I can see is intolerance when I see those principles applied. Intolerance to blasphemers, intolerance to homosexuals, intolerance in general. Now, the other question, the other thing I want to say is this God, if we ask what's sensible, why would we think that this unproven God that is supposed to be the basis of not just Islam, but all religions, different gods, different characteristics, but the Islamic God, much like the Judeo-Christian God, is a real creep. This is a God worse than Saddam Hussein. Instead of tor torturing you just for your life, tortures you for infinity, forgive me the word, but eternity, let me use that word, eternity for not believing. For not believing, you're tortured for infinity. The tortures are actually described in the Quran, and you know it as well as I do. And the point is, if you just ask yourself common sense, if you were a divine being, say you had an ant colony that you made in your house, would you be offended if those ants didn't pay homage to you five, well, let's start with 50 times a day before Muhammad cut it down to 30 and then five. Would you be offended if those ants didn't pay homage to you five times a day? And if they didn't, if they didn't look up to you or didn't recognize your existence, would you destroy them? No, I mean, it just seems so petty. So why should we believe in a hateful, unmerciful, petty, sadomasochistic, homophobic, sexist God? It's just irrational. It's not sensible. There's nothing, it's, and, there, and the point is, it, and, and, and I, don't want to, I don't want to single out Islam here, and I know I'm offending some people, but the same is true for the God of Moses. Okay? It, if, you read, if you really believe that the scriptures were, were literally true, the morals in that book are reprehensible. It's okay when, you know, when an angel, and angels appear to do a lot of things, including coming down and, 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 and uh, re making revelations to Muhammad, which Muhammad didn't write down. As far as I know, the first example of the Quran was 20 years after he died, so there was a lot of talk. And some of that talk got turned into perfect writing well after Muhammad was dead. But those angels come down. But in this case, in the case of, of course, Lot, as you know, the angels came down, and, um, and, they, and they were men. They came in the form of men, which I don't think um, is allowed in, in, in certain versions of the Quran, at least. But anyway, they did. And then they were going to be raped. So what did Lot do? Of course, he said, don't rape them. Take my daughters. Because daughters are dispensable. What kind of, what kind of moral lesson is that that you want to learn? Okay? Now, I'm sorry, that's from the Bible. Actually, that's from my religion. Okay? Or my an ancestors' religion. I have none. Okay? So those are the kind of moral lessons that I find not sensible. And so, so I'm, I'm happy I picked the Old Testament and not the Koran to talk about uh, um, I immoral intolerance. The idea of punishing people for eternity, for choosing to find something unlikely, is not tolerant. The idea of punishing them in vicious, evil, ugly ways for all eternity is not merciful. It is the opposite of rational common sense. Now, in terms of explanatory things, let me just spend a few minutes teaching a little bit of science. So, if you have an infinite temporal, let's say time exists beyond our universe. Let's just allow for that because it's easier to describe that. And let's say our universe, a universe can, given the laws of nature, spontaneously come into existence. Okay? Then, it will come into existence. It will come into existence at some time. And the fact that it came into existence at that time need not have any reason. There's not, it need not have any reason why it was that time 
rather than some other time. But whatever time it happens, it will come into existence and people can say, there's some significance to that. But it must happen somewhere at some time and there need not be any significance, any purpose, any intelligence for why it happened now instead of then. It's guaranteed to happen at some point. Now if you say, during that creation, there are laws, one of which is the quantum, laws of quantum mechanics, which can create a universe with zero total energy. By the way, and by creating a universe, I mean a universe that didn't exist. There was no space, there were no times, and no laws, in fact. And then you come in and you say, okay, if that universe is created spontaneously, it must be created at some time. So a universe must come into existence. In fact, an infinite number of universes come, can come into existence if time is infinite. Okay? It's certainly possible. Then, a universe will come into existence and you can say, let me predict the properties of that universe. Well, lo and behold, the properties of that universe happen to be exactly the properties of the universe we live in, including the structure of the fluctuations of cosmic microwave background that collapse to produce all the galaxies and all the stars and the planets and you and me. That's explanatory. There's no explanation at that level in any way in your book. So the explanation of a universe that could come into existence from nothing without any purpose, without any planning, without any reason, is explanatory. Now, lest I be misconstrued, that is just plausible. Because we do not have a full scientific theory. But to make the claim, as I know you've often made, that because that there are certain things we will never understand, is to, is, is to misunderstand science. There are lots of things we don't understand today, and that's the reason to go out and do science. It's just like Darwin said, you know, he said, in the evolution of the species, I'm describing the evolution of the species. I'm not describing the origin of life. We'll never understand the origin of life. We'll no sooner understand the origin of life than we understand the origin of matter. Well, of course, he didn't realize that we'd un one day understand the origin of matter. Just as I expect in your lifetime and my lifetime, we'll understand the origin of life. We'll understand how chemistry turns into biology. By doing experiments, testing, and not forcing our predilection that it's impossible. I had a debate recently with somebody who said, it's impossible for non-life to turn into life. Well, that's a nice statement. It's a nice belief. And it's a belief you can have, but it's a belief that can be wrong. And that's the great thing about science which you can call atheism if you wish, is you're willing to change your beliefs. You're not assuming the answers before you ask the question. You're not assuming you know what's divinely right just because you interpret a certain book to mean a certain thing and someone else may interpret it to mean something else. You will agree there are different interpretations of every book including the Bible and the Koran. And so you, to presume that you know divine truth before you've asked the universe is not sensible. And I don't think I'll take any more time. Thank you, Professor Krauss. Uh, now, over, back over to Hamza. Three minutes it will be, thereabouts. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much for your presentation. Now, I really want you to try and address some of my arguments. You produced something about with the Quran, but if you were attentive to my argument, the Quran says bring a chapter like it, not two verses from different chapters. So, again, it was a straw man of the articulation of what the Quranic miracle was. And I could spend more time maybe doing the Q&A to explain what that is, but I specifically said bring one chapter like it. Your computer model, which I like to see evidence of, by the way. But, but who just decides what's like it? I mean, who is, do you decide or do I? Okay, is that a different to question? To me, shapes are more beautiful than the Quran. That's fine. Okay. But, uh, or if, James if, Joyce. Yes. He doesn't use iambic inhabitor. I understand, sir. Okay. But what you have to understand, sir, is this is that I repeated maybe more than once, it's not based on aesthetic reception and your opinions on beauty. Who's, who's, who determined it? Well, it's the reality, empirical reality. No, who, I, I'm going to explain. Let, let me explain what the argument is again, because from your onset, you've misunderstood it. You thought you it was beauty. You quoted people who said it couldn't have been created. But those are just literary scholars. What, I mean, what if I say, yeah, it could be created? Yeah, let me just explain that, because okay. your first presupposition was based on a falsehood, wasn't it? Yeah? You thought it was aesthetic reception. It's based upon the structural features of the Arabic language. Now, because I only have two minutes, I'll continue that in the Q&A, okay? okay? So, also you're saying about that, look, if the universe began, and we could show that maybe empirically or deductively, uh, my focus is on the deduction here, and I don't think you really address from the infinite perspective, 
when we said that this is based on axioms and conventions in the mathematical realm of discourse, but in discrete physical parts, as you've, you've admitted in your book, that can't happen. So we have a deductive argument that the universe began, which means it once wasn't there. Ontologically, if there wasn't a cause for that, you wouldn't have the universe in the first place. The second point I like to make... No, there's a fo you see the photon that's lighting you up from that thing? Yes. It didn't exist well, before it was emitted by the electron. Yes. Okay. It didn't exist. Yes. It wasn't there. And you're saying there's no cause? It, there, it wasn't, you know, point is, yeah, I'm, I'm saying this. I'm saying, what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, there can be physical causes for physical effects. Yes. Okay, but they don't have to be, but God doesn't have to pull the, the photon up. Just because the photon appears from nothing doesn't require something supernatural. I agree. But okay, the, but so if a universe suddenly one, comes one into second. existence where it wasn't before, it doesn't require something supernatural. But I already, I already gave you a defeat to the argument that you assume that when things begin to exist, they may not require any causes. And that defeat was... Not any purpose. I didn't say cause. I, look, I just said if a universe can come into existence by physical causes, yes. where there's no universe to begin with, it will happen at some time. And your point was, it I agree. happened, and therefore, it, there's a reason no, why no, no, it no, happened, no. because it happened when it happened. Putting, well, if it didn't happen then, it would have happened some other time, you, and we would have had this conversation at some Let's other calm time. down. You're putting words in my mouth, okay? okay. What, what I'm did saying you say to you, then? Maybe I'm not then saying you're... things like, I'm not talking about teleolo teleology. I'm not talking about there don't is use, a purpose behind Don't use definition. Did you not say, our universe came into existence for a cause, and there had to be a reason for it? No, I didn't say reason. I, what, there what? had to be a purpose? No, I didn't say that. I said there is a oh, cause. Oh, I thought you said there was an intelligence. You gave a whole long argument. Oh, that's after using conceptual analysis that you agree that there is a uncreated creator or a cause that was uncaused. Now... Well, hold on, but yeah. what, forget all that. I just talked about our universe. Yeah. You, you, are you agreeing with me that our universe doesn't have to have a, 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 any purpose or reason to create it? No, of course I'm not. I don't agree with you. Well, but that's not my argument. My argument is, deductively, was the universe once absent? Yes. yes. If that's the case, then ontologically, which means the, the nature and source of reality is that it couldn't have come into being without a cause. Well, well, okay. First of all, the sim. I wish. I hope it's that way because that'd be easier to understand. Yes. Okay. It, it's possible that it's not that way. Okay. So if it has, and we, you could take this out of my time if you want. I don't give a damn. Um, the, 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 the point is that maybe. Maybe time exists outside of our universe, maybe yes. it doesn't. Let's just pretend it does, and then our universe came into existence, and there was a physical cause for that. That's fine, I'm, I'm fine with that. I'm fine with our universe coming into existence for physical cause, just like that photon being created. But as I pointed out to you, it's equally possible that these notions that we have in our brains, because we're humans living at a classical level, that time, that some, that time exists and is a continuous flow, may break down. And if they break down at t equals zero, then any sense of the word cause becomes nonsensical. That, and yeah. the, the word cause is a red herring in yes. your terms. It's not worth discussing. It may not be relevant to the creation of our universe because there may not have been any time before it. And therefore, there may, this notion that every, every cause, every effect has a cause may be irrelevant if there's no time. Now, I don't know if that's the case, but I'm willing, yes. to, I'm willing to ask the question, and I'm willing to do studies to see if it's reasonable. Yes. I'm not willing to presume the answer before I ask the question. Well, of course, I agree. Okay. But the point is, the presumption here is, is that you require time, and that there's a specific physical definition for time. Now, well, the presumption is after t equals zero, you require time. That's absolutely true. The presumption that you require time at t equals zero, if you took the equations as they're written, no, no. You, time would go out the I'm, window. I'm not, I'm not, I don't have a contention with the physics. That's your job. No, no, but, there's no, yeah. but if, if you take it as a written, there's no time. The time has no meaning at t equals zero. Okay, I agree. Great. According, so no according to the physics, I, I don't disagree with okay. you. I, 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 highly, I highly respect that. But all of that is inductive in nature. No, it's not. Of course, well, what is it based on? Is it deductive? It's based on observation. Which is inductive. <laughs> well, it, no, no, it's empirical. <laughs> it's empirical. You know, you, you, you know, the problem is... It's empirical. It's okay, well, what's nothing. empirical? Okay, okay, look, I don't care. Look, the point do, you, is do you have an infinite set of observations? Mm -hmm. Have you had an infinite set of observations? Uh, now, if you're going to tell me, I read, your, I read your, uh, something you wrote which really misrepresented science. You're absolutely right if you're going to tell me science can never tell anything with absolute certainty. Yes. Okay? That's Except exactly. things that are wrong. Yes. That's what science can tell. I agree. Science can tell us the Earth isn't 6,000 years okay, old. Okay, good. Science can tell us that, that science can tell us many things. And so I don't disagree science, with you. Okay. I don't so disagree fact, with you. Okay, so the fact that science can lead us closer to, the, to what is the underlying reality 
is absolutely true. And the fact that, that science can't say with anything with absolute certainty is absolutely true, except what's wrong. Yes, I agree. Okay. okay. And it can say certain claims, for example, that the moon split in two when he was there, it was wrong. Now, I know you're going to say red herring. interpretation. Another red herring. I know another red herring. But certainly, Loads of fish in this room today. No, 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 no. <laughs> some people, as you'll know, some people, as you know, some interpreters of that thought that was the case, but they're wrong. You agree with me? That, that's it. That, that's Do you agree that I'm making a different point here, Professor. That claim, okay, but all I'm saying is this is a book of words, and you can interpret it many different ways, and some interpretation of those I'm gonna, words I'm going to address that. I'm going to address that as well. But that's, look, we're okay. going from so many different issues. Like a, it's a typical strategy of not knowing how to respond to a particular point. Look. The point of interpretation, for example, the Quran, for example, if we read the whole of the Quran holistically, we understand that it's probably the only religious book that gives you tools of interpretation. For example, the Quran says there are some open-ended verses, ambiguous verses, and they're specified. So in linguistics, it's called intra and intertextuality. Now, therefore, it creates a scope of interpretation. Yes, I agree there's interpretation, but there are some things that are lie outside of the scope because you don't know the language, you don't know the interpretive tools, you don't follow the scholarly tradition, etc. So there is, yes, I agree, a, a scope of interpretation, but it's, it's fixed. So that is, in, in essence, the red herring. The point I want to get to What's here, different about that than, say, Bibli uh, Christian uh, uh, um, uh, theology, theological is different interpretation of the Bible? Well, that's There's very no interesting. Well, for example, in the Protestant tradition, the reason they moved away from the Catholic Church is because they said, look, it's me and my book, and I could interpret the way I want. But now a lot of Protestants are coming back to the Catholic tradition because they're saying, how do I understand God's word? And that's why they see the church entity as an interpretive authority, do you see? So obviously they have their own confusions, but the book doesn't tell it how to interpret it. That's, that's why you have the German school of systematic theology. The, the Catholic church, which yeah. now accepts evolution, for example, would say, you're right, the book doesn't tell us how to interpret yep. this uh, yep. ridiculous first But I just want to get back to my original point, which is, if... Did so there's nothing unique about it. You keep pretending you, Islam is unique, and I don't see it. Can we do with a point at a time? Okay. Yeah, okay. No, no, okay. But, no, no, but you throw these things out. We believe Islam is not unique. If I don't Professor, challenge them, Professor, then, then they'll we don't believe accepted. Islam is unique. We believe oh. it's a universal message. I believe it's the one true God. Don't enslave yourself to your ego and your, and your desires and the beast to aspects of man or to the social pressure. L'Oreal, because I'm worth it. So but free than yourself. Than free yourself from these... Free yourself from these shackles and worship the divine, which gives you true freedom. Because if you want real liberty, liberty interesting, the word ruh in the Arabic language means soul or self. And it comes from the trilateral stem. Soul or self, which one? Both, okay. in different contexts, okay? We just be nuanced, okay? Yeah. Not reductionist. So, What's a soul? You want to tell me what a soul is? Well, when you die, you'll find out. Let me just get my point. <laughs> Let me make That's my point. That's a really bad explanation. Well, you know, because come on. Because it, it gives me something I can't test. You know? Listen, I I'm the Greek. I'm supposed to be full of sophistry and rhetoric. Yeah? Well, you are. But that's true. Okay. <laughs> the point I'm trying to say is that the word the roh etymologically shares the same meaning with the word raha, which means liberty and serenity. And interestingly, you know, we all want to seek this type of liberty. But the irony is, from an existential perspective, you know, what does it mean to exist? Who am I? We're all in a state of slavery because your birth, sir, your birth, madam, is just like the American writer once wrote, we're, be, we're born and then we're sold into slavery. You never chose your birth. Well, it was Rousseau who said that. Man is born free and yeah, lives forever. Yeah, slavery. exactly. Okay. Well done. Yeah, Good. Yeah. So let me, it wasn't yeah, but let, me, let, me, let me get poetic here. Yeah? Okay. So the point is, we don't choose our birth. I didn't choose I was going to be Greek looking like a Pakistani. <laughs> You never, you never chose that. Shave, you wouldn't look so that so Pakistani. Well, you know, I'm growing my hair just like yours. Okay. So, that's yeah. true. <laughs> it's nice. That's true. So the thing is, the thing I'm I trying like to say. I like your hair, by the way. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we're becoming friends now, yeah. <laughs> so the point I'm trying to say is, look, you know, let's let's be nuanced about some of the narratives from religion. Like, you know, in essence, we that's how. See, so you have to empathize and see the filters that the Muslim will use. And like, that's why a Muslim woman who may cover her hair, a Muslim man who may grow a beard, these are not reasons because it's like this kind of ridiculous type of blind slavery. We really understand that the only way to free yourself from the shackles of the ephemeral nature of social pressure, because we're social animals, of the very fact that you didn't choose your birth or your ethnicity or even your own gender, you free yourself from these shackles by what we call ubudiyya, a servanthood to the divine reality. So. So, but, but the question I want to ask is, is, is yes. it sensible? So why is it sensible for a woman to be covered up and not a man? Well, I am covered. No, no, you're not covered up. 
You're not covered you up. You're not put in a bag <laughs> like the, some of the people back there. Well, you're it's not, not really a bag. No, it is. Yeah? As far as I'm concerned, it is. Okay, look, that's a different question. I'm not going to get into the, the, mor the moral judgments on certain traditions because at the end of the day, and we I were... Them, and, and by the way, they're all only Islamic. I mean, I, you know, I, I, if you want me to offend other religions, I'm happy No, to I'm not them. saying that, okay. Krauss, but someone who is rationalizing incest doesn't have no more high ground to point the finger at Muslim women. I mean, and the other point, and the other point, no, no, but let me finish. Let me finish. Let me finish. I didn't. I, I, I explained why. Let me complete the sentence. I'm sure it wouldn't go ad infinitum. Okay. Let me make my point. Well, we could go ad infinitum because it could last an infinite amount of time. It's potentially. So, not actually. Would you agree? Potentially, yeah, but not actually. That was my point, which you misunderstood. So, the point I'm trying to say, uh, Professor Krauss, is this: is that, you know, these pointing the finger at other traditions. Oh, oh. Okay. Where is your ontological basis for an objective moral value like this? Well, you know, in fact... Is it objectively wrong that she's wearing a bag? What? No. Is it objectively morally wrong? Uh, and how is it objectively morally wrong? wrong? I asked if it's sensible. Okay, is it it's sensible? Okay. And, I, and, and so my question to you is, it seems to me that given the fact that I happen to view women and men as, you know, we have, we have differences, inherent genetic differences. Of course, yes. But in, 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 but in every other sense, we're equal human beings. And in fact, in many senses, as you know, there are advantages and disadvantages. We don't disagree with so that. So I do not see any reason to treat women differently than men. I don't, it doesn't make sense to me. That's all I'm saying. Okay, fair okay. enough, good. Okay. So the point is, when we make moral judgments, I know you use the word sensible, but other times we're uh, making no, no, moral I don't, judgments. I don't, I don't talk, unlike you, I don't talk about morals, because I try, in, in this sense, the question before us was not, is atheism moral, or is Islam moral, it's is it sensible? And when people act... So why have you sensibly. spent 25 minutes Pointing the finger and making moral judgments rather than rather than trying to do with my argument. I didn't make For a moral, example, I didn't you make thought a moral judgment about your in misinterpretation of whether infinity is allowed in physics. I didn't make a moral. I judgment. never said that. I made a factual judgment. I never said judgment. that. I said it, it makes sense in physics because you need the mathematics to correspond to physical reality. I don't disagree with that. I am so saying. So you need the mathematics to correspond to physical reality. Is that what you just said? Yeah, of course you do. Yeah, according so to physical physics. physical reality can according, allow for infinity. According to what, I learned a lot from your book, actually. It was quite interesting. You said, even in your book, I think it was page 81, you said that essentially, you know, there's the maths, and I need to improve my physics to ensure it's in line with the math. And interestingly. No, no I need to improve my math to ensure it's in line with reality. Okay, good. So okay. what with is the it? evidence of experiment? Yes, good. Ex so if my math doesn't agree with the evidence of experiment, then I change my math. And that's why I think, and I don't want to build a straw man, you made a conclusion in your book, you said, this is why you can't have an infinite anything. No. You said that. You show book. me where I can't have an infinite anything. Yeah, Did you, I talk uh, about infinite energy density? Let me, let me, let me, let me I find talk about whether the universe might be infinite? Let me find it for you. And by the way, if I did, I was wrong. <laughs> One that, second. That to me, that no, to that, me, that's, that's that honorable. That is honorable. That to me is the worst kind. That's, that's honorable. No, that is honorable. I admit. The offensive about these arguments is you quote people as if what they say matters. But the great thing about science is there are no authorities. I agree. There are no I, scientific authorities. Everyone can be wrong, and we all are. That is honorable. That is honorable. I have to. People who claim to be, including Benedict, before he stopped being Pope. You, yeah, one second. I will, uh, one second. Just, just bear with me. He, he wanted it here, here somewhere. No, no, I'm enjoying it. Yeah, <laughs> no, this is good, this is good. Okay, so here we go. Infinity is not a pleasant quantity, however, at least as far as physicists are concerned, and we try to avoid it whenever possible. Whenever clearly, possible. clearly, the energy of empty space, or anything else for that matter, cannot be physically infinite. The energy of anything. No. You said... I'm sorry. Or sorry. anything else for that matter. The energy of anything cannot be physically where, where, infinite. Where's that there? The energy of empty space or the energy of anything else. You're reading be. another book now. I wrote the Well, Mohammed may not be here to talk about the Quran, but I'm here to talk about my book. And you don't even know your own book. And my book, <laughs> and my book says, I repeat. Yes, do that. I repeat. Maybe I should change it to Arabic so you understand it. But the point is, the energy of empty space or the energy of anything else cannot be infinite. 
Oh, okay. 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 That's Fair enough. what I said. Okay. Good. So really, yeah. it, it's suggestive of my point. No. Sorry. It didn't say space cannot. Did you get this sign, by the way? It didn't say space. Oh, yeah. It didn't say space cannot be infinite or time cannot be infinite. Good. Because they perfectly well can. Okay. Good. But okay. there's another point you made. Wait. 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 You wait. Know, the know, other point is. Don't. I mean, you're making a big mistake to try and talk. No, to I'm not. Okay. I'll be happy to. You'll have to be happy to show me what you said if I misquote. Listen. You. Listen, okay. Professor Kras. I can only read your words well, when you say or anything else for that matter means or anything else. But I know I should have, I was know. That, was that paragraph about energy? Yeah, but, but. Okay, just ask me. Oh, the so question. there's a context now, but when it comes to religion, there is no context. No, there is. But when it comes to physics, there's a context. No, I talked to you about the fact that different <laughs> interpretations lead. Fair enough, in your, I agree, I agree. have interpreted the Quran incorrectly. I agree, Professor Krauss, but okay. listen to this. What you have to understand is this. You don't, do you agree that the universe started at, at a finite time ago? Do I agree? Yes. The Could you made that point. The point seven two billion years ago. Yes. As, as far back as we can go to about the first um, millionth of a second. Ten to the minus second. forty three or something. Well, no. no. Did it change? Empirically, we know it's about a millionth of a millionth of a second. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Good. Of course, good. So good. Time. Exactly. So that I said was suggested suggestive evidence for my deductive reasoning. Okay. Well, it was suggestive evidence for the Rig Veda, Akhenaten. The, the, the yeah, I know. Good, 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 good. Let's North carry on now. Myth, it's just as beautiful. It was created. I agree. I okay. agree. But then I said, but since we now we have the best possible explanation, which is an uncreated creator, or there is a Why cause is that, that was not caused. Because I, I gave you all the logical explanation. This is the point. You should be attentive. No, I have the best explanation. It came from nothing by physics. Yes, but okay. you're nothing. Is it really like n nothing? No space, no time. Our universe didn't exist. So there's no. There was no quantum foam. There was nothing where our universe existed. There was no space and no time. Everything we see, this room that we're in, so when, did not exist. So when your friend Vilenkin comments on that. Then we have a Q and a One second. So when, so when your friend Alexander Vilenkin, who's a renowned cosmologist. Yeah, a good friend. Yes. A good friend. I mean, I read some of his works. It goes way beyond me. Eh? I have to do that. And in that. fact, you know what? Yeah. You know what? In fact, Alex Vilenkin, as you read in my book, as I did. In fact, he scooped me because he wrote Yes, he did. I read that. Yeah, that was very interesting. Talked yeah. about a creation of space from no space. Yes, I agree. Okay. Recently, he has mentioned that there is a spatio-temporal boundary, right? No. What has he said? Well, uh, Hawk, he is, I mean, you know, we, we can talk about the details of the instanton that he described. In yes, the yes, yes. But in fact, there is no space at the, at the central point of that. Okay, agreed. So but, see, my main point is that this evidence is suggestive of an evidence that is what I would call far more stronger. It has great epistemic value, and I'm going to end on this. Because it has great epistemic value, because as you admitted, the inductive method doesn't lead to certain conclusions, whereas the deductive method leads to certainty. Now, you can't get but it all the time. Wrong. But <laughs> no, if the premises. I'm, I can be certain about something being wrong. Can you, yeah, can you? I agree. Okay. But, Kraus, if the premises are sound and the logic is valid, it's still certain. You still what have to prove to me. Your yeah, but, Kraus, you st Professor Kraus, you still have to prove to me that the deductive logic I used is unsound or, or not valid, and you haven't done that. Well, okay. You don't think I have, I do. Okay, uh, I'm really sorry to interrupt you, Professor Kraus, Hamza, you're going at it hammer and tongs, but there's a whole bunch of guys out there who want to sort of have a say, okay? Okay, guys, settle down. We're going to get the first question right now. Okay, my first question is to Professor Kraus, and this is just to sort out the sort of the whole thing we're talking about. I just opened up your page and it says, nothing is something. There you go. Where, where, that's, the that's the title of a chapter. That's the title of a chapter. Nothing okay. is something, right? And, and, and you know uh, what I meant? No, no right? and my, my, I'm going to ask my second question now. Okay. Your whole book is based on mathematics, and mathematics, as you know, is based on deduction. No, it's, it's based on evidence. Okay, and you use evidence. mathematics throughout your book, and you say deductive... Show me the equations in my book. Show me the equations. Okay. Are there equations? Yes, they are. Well, there are one or two. The books are 200 pages long. <laughs> okay. L let me just ask my I question. My, my, my first question was, you said nothing is something as soon as you open the book. Yeah. Secondly, you said deductive method, deduction, deduction doesn't work, and maths is based upon deduction. No, it may not work. No, no, you said it in the opening. Deduction doesn't work, and your book is full of mathematics and deduction. Mathematics is based upon deduction. So how do you... Uh, it's actually a good introduction to logical fallacies. Oh. <laughs> Professor, you want to say something? Okay, I mean, th these rhetorical things are so ridiculous, but okay. Um, I like uh, catchy phrases. And when I said nothing is something, in the ch it's, in the, it's a chapter title. My point, which many philosophers don't understand, and, and I, I guess, I, anyway. 
um, is that um, nothing is a physical quantity. It's not a philosophical quantity. It's not an imaginary quantity. Nothing in physics is the absence of something. So therefore, to understand what nothing is, you first have to ask the question, what is something? And to do that requires a lot of work. It's required all of the work of the 20th century of a lot of bright people, experimentalists and physicists. So what I try to do is explain what we mean by something so that people could actually learn what you mean by the absence of something. I tried to be very clear and accurate. So it was just, in fact, since I wasn't trying to convince people of anything, I was just trying to explain it. The point is, in physics, nothing is the absence of something. So to understand what the absence of something is, you have to describe, um, you, have to, you have to know what something is to know what the absence of that thing is, first. Secondly, mathematics is mathematics. You're absolutely right. But physics isn't mathematics. I did a degree in mathematics, and I did a degree in physics. I learned I wasn't a mathematician. And more importantly, I learned many of my, the best mathematician colleagues of mine weren't physicists. Because the universe, the way physics works, is that we make mathematical models, models of reality, but we don't decide that they're right. We say, in fact, I do it all the time, and most of them are wrong. I sit at, at, on a good day, trying to make a mathematical model that explains reality. They go out and test it, and 99.99% .99 of the time, it's wrong. Because that's the way science works. If it didn't work that way, anyone could do it. So it's not inductive in the sense the mathematics is a useful language. In fact, it's the only useful language to describe nature, as far as we can tell. But it doesn't, we don't decide. Mathematics can describe an infinite number of universes. Uh, you know, you can write mathematical descriptions of an infinite number of universes. Most of them are in our universe. The way we determine if there are universe is we go out and do experiment. Science is experimental. Without experiment, pure thought leads nowhere. If you locked a particle physicist in a room and asked her to come up with a theory of reality without any experimental observation, she'd come up with the wrong answer. Okay. You didn't actually answer the question there. Yeah? Just to just to reiterate, because you didn't actually answer it, yeah? You said deduction doesn't work. No, okay. I didn't. No, no, no. Yes, you said it in the opening. Your, I said your it book. doesn't have to Okay, work. let me just repeat the it's question, because you didn't understand the first time, right? You said deduction doesn't work, and your book has mathematics. And what I want to ask okay, you is... Okay, fine, I agree with you. Next question. Okay, what is deduction? That's my question. What is deduction? Do you even know what deduction is? Because I studied mathematics at university. You know I don't what? even think you know what really, it means. You know what, what is deduction? You know, you know what? The, yeah. What is let me just say, I know, let me just say, let me just say this, okay? You can make definitions of things. I can try and figure out how the universe works. I'll make progress, and you'll sit here. Okay, thanks very much. Um, next question, please. actually understand Arabic more to get more scientific ideas out of the Quran. Um, but where is the LHC equivalent um, in terms of Islam? What is that? What is the LHC equivalent? Uh, uh, Large LHC, Hadron Collider equivalent. Large Hadron okay. Collider. Okay, in Islam? Oh, yes, or genomics. I mean, wouldn't it be a better idea just to study the Quran and, and come out with these results? Okay. And when can we it's see it's those a good big question. results? Uh, first point. The first point is, um, that essay that was written wasn't to show that the Quran gives science. If you read the essay, it basically says the Quran is very general and at most places concerning science quite ambiguous. Now in Islamic theology, these verses are what we call teleological, they're there for a specific end just to make you think. Like only, frankly, only someone really silly is going to think that you're going to find quantum physics and embryology in a holy book. Cause that's, that's, not the, that's not the divine, that's not the will of the creator. And St. Augustine said for the Bible, too, the Bible isn't a scientific book. Yeah, but it's not a scientific book. It's yeah, anyone's Like Al Shatibi, he was a theologian, and he said, look, this book, the Quran, is there to make you think about the most important questions about life man, life, and the universe. Who am I? Whose am I? Why am I? For whom am I? These existential questions. And I yes. I agree with that, by the way. I the, think it probably is that. Thank you, sir. Okay. So the, 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 point, the point I'm trying to make here from the embryology perspective is to show not that the Quran is scientific per se but that its language is not representative of a 7th century science. That was my main point. So it's got nothing to do with the fact... Wouldn't there be more? Sorry? Wouldn't there be more science? No, but why should there be? Oh, oh, my main... 
No, but, but, I, I, but, but well, 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 in some cases there is, but not in terms of here are the details. It's more like, you know the unique thing about the Quranic discourse, for example? When it talks about natural phenomena, it will present a word, for example. And that word will have a scope of meaning. And you could check this meaning out for yourself. And interestingly, it's, an ali it's aligned with past errors and future accuracies as well, which is very interesting. So, this is more future accuracy. Yeah, but I would argue that in some cases that you do see future accuracies. Yeah, However, yeah. I don't believe... Let, let, me, let, 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 let me make my point. My argument for the Quran is not a scientific one because I believe science as Professor Krauss admitted and really didn't answer somehow, was that inductive, the inductive method doesn't give you certainties. So we believe the Qur'an we can prove deductively and it tells us to do the science to see how things work. We may be wrong, we may be right. So it would be only erroneous to say that something that is deductive can be proven by something that's speculative or inconclusive. And this is why, I, and I empathize with you, the current trend in our modern, what we call da'wah, propagation of Islam, is heavily reliant on science. But we have to understand what science is. That's why I wrote the essay on have we misunderstood evolution. I don't deny the science of evolution. I just go to modern academics on the philosophy of science. And there are issues like the problem of hard or weak empiricism, the problem of induction, falsification, and so forth. So from that perspective, I think you've misunderstood the, the point of the paper. Uh, yeah, I, but I, 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 I hope I elaborated. To, to, to suggest that evolution was not a, a, as well at, uh, and tested a, the, uh, a scientific idea as gravity or quantum mechanics. It, we make new drugs based on it. In fact, the evidence of evolution makes evolution a fact. Okay, okay. Uh, I, I even addressed that. Yeah, and no, I, I, I tried to read it, and it seemed to me that you were suggesting it wasn't. But anyway, that, I may have misunderstood it. So I'm willing to I'm willing to agree that I may have misunderstood it. But that's the lesson I was getting out of okay, it. Okay, good. M maybe we could sit, have a coffee after. Okay, this. we're going to go to the Jazakallah. We go to the next question, please. Uh, thank you for the very emotive debate. My question is to Professor Lawrence Krauss. Why did I guess that? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. No, go on. Anyway. Uh, firstly, let's not conflate science with atheism. What? Firstly, let's not conflate science with atheism, as we would all agree that science doesn't logically entail atheism. It is methodologically neutral. Um, therefore, my question is this. Science being a, a empirical method based on observation experimentation can never answer metaphysical questions such as the existence of God. So, then the, it would arise, how do you as an atheist maintain your position? Because you've said, for example, empirically speaking, we can't say God exists or does not exist. Rationally, deductive, you've already ruled out. Therefore, how can you rationally justify your belief? How can you say it's common sense and nonsensical, please? Well, Thank well, you very much. That's a good question. I, I, okay, I should clarify that. I think it's a very good question. Um, and so, yeah, let me call that question. Yeah. Okay, let, let me try to clarify this. I, I, I want to once more, again, emphasize that atheism is not a belief. Okay, it's not a belief. As a scientist, I don't believe anything. As a scientist, I don't believe anything. I, if you will use the word belief, scientists shouldn't use the word belief. There are things that are more likely and less likely. In fact, in the spirit of Hamza, it's, it, it, science can say nothing with absolute certainty. It can say something is very, very likely or something is very, very unlikely based on the evidence of experience and, and testing. I can't see you, but I know you're there. Okay, and so um, I find it easier to talk to a person. Okay, and no, 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 stay there, stay there, I can see you now. Um, so so the, the question is, what is more likely? That's all atheists are saying, and the atheists are saying, look, the first thing they're saying, I mean, people who claim they're atheists, and by the way, you know, most scientists don't think enough about God to even know if they're atheists, because God's irrelevant. God never comes up in any scientific conference, in any discussion, anywhere, it doesn't. Because, in fact, we're just trying to figure out how the universe works. You're absolutely right also to the fact that I want to stress one more time that science, and I may slightly differ with my friend Richard Dawkins about this, I don't think a lot, science does not require atheism. And the proof of that is empirical. Since I believe empirical proof, I have several colleagues of mine who are very good scientists who aren't atheists. Therefore, since they're very good scientists and they're also not atheists, science doesn't require atheism. Now, people can hold contradictory ideas at the same time. That's one of the reasons. But science can never disprove purpose in the universe. All we can ask is, given the evidence of our observation, do I think it is more likely that there's a personal God that cares about this random uh, planet 
around a random galaxy in the middle of 400 billion galaxies in a universe in which everything we see is just 1% of the whole universe. You could get rid of us and all the galaxies and everything. The universe would be largely the same. We're a bit of cosmic pollution. It seems ridiculous to imagine for me, based on everything I see and my common sense, to imagine the universe was created for me. That's all. Okay, thank you, Professor. Uh, let's go to the next question. Hello, Mr. Krauss, and uh, salam alaikum, uh, Mr. Uh, Sortsis. A very good talk. I just have a question for Hamza. Uh, so you started off uh, talking about uh, you know infinity, and uh, uh, I mean a lot of these arguments were sort of William Lane Craig type arguments. Who, by the way, Fox News loves. Um, now my question is: We've got a guy here who's who's written 300 books on astronomy, cosmology, whatever, and we we I mean there is a lot of talk about Islam, about the Quran having scientific evidence behind it, um, cosmologically as well. Why didn't we ask him these questions? Why didn't we say, well, I don't know. You said that. You don't know. So why not ask him? He's there. I mean, why, why not? This is, this is a forum for conversation. Why didn't we have... The, well, I didn't hear one time, except for when you mentioned quantum vacuum, where he explained to you what quantum vacuum is. Yeah. Like, other than that, I didn't hear anything. So I'm, I'm really interested as to why that conversation didn't happen in, in, in here. Because my argument wasn't a scientific one. But, uh, I, could, I could do that in Starbucks well, or on, for the on, leftists amongst you in, 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 in another coffee so shop. Just like William Lane Craig often tries to no, 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 no. use the evidence of the Big Bang. No, the, let's, yeah. let's be attentive to my argument. It wasn't a key premise. Yeah, it was, I even repeated. Well, I, I guarantee you, I agree with you, it was not scientific at yeah. all. Yeah, uh, exactly. Well, well done. So <laughs> all, all, my point was it was just suggestive. You're if right, you, suggestive. If you remove that argument, you still have my deductive argument that hasn't been addressed. No, I, I, I know. Yeah. What I'm saying is, then why did you use the linguistic argument? Why not this, like, the... Because there's, I, there's I, so don't, many arguments I, don't, I don't hold the view, I don't hold the view that the scientific argument per se is strong enough to become a deductive Right, so it argument. has to be linguistic. So you, you, so let's make... No, there's clear. many this, others. There's historical, a, there's numerical. This, this is a, I, I could give right, them I'll to go. you now. Historical is also based on evidence. Let me make this clear, because it could be a real difference and it should just represent our fundamental differences. Yeah, of course. You don't believe that your beliefs should conform to the evidence of reality. No, of course not. Okay. I don't. Good. Okay, no, but you well, that's fine. But Krauss, you just even agreed that science itself, which we love and we think is a mercy from the divine reality to use, mm -hmm. that has that has correlated verses indicating we must use reality and, and be empirical. You've assumed that, that that empiricism itself would lead to an understanding of reality, absolutely. But no, you, you no, no, agreed no, 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 no. that's I not the case. I never said any absolutes. I've always said plausible, likely, unlikely. That's the way but science works. And, and the whole question here is what's more sensible? And the point is, once again, I said empirically, a thousand religions, you're athe all atheists for 999 of them. I'm just an atheist for one yeah, more. Yeah, but this is precisely my point. Yeah. Why would I therefore use an empirical inductive method to form beliefs that I believe are certain. That would be obnoxious of me. So what I do is, if I believe something is so certain as the existence of the divine and the miraculous nature of the Quran, I'm not going to use an inductive method which is speculative and probabilistic, which you would even agree, ranges from 0 to 99%. I would have to rely heavily on what you would call other methods, epistemic roots to knowledge, such as deduction. And are There's they nothing sensible? Well, the and they are sensible. And here's the question, as Carl they Sagan are. would have said, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And the claim that you're absolutely certain of the truth, that you, that you personally are absolutely certain of the truth, is a remarkable claim. No. And the evidence you presented Straw was, man. was not... Was Straw not man. Yours. I'm absolutely okay. certain of very basic truths, and this is called epistemic foundationalism. Well, I don't have that presumption. I'm you, not that presumptuous. Well, you obviously have a presumption that induction works. That's the truth no, in I itself. No, I don't have the presumption that I know the truth. Let's okay. presume there's more questions as well. Okay, let's go. Um, hi, my, my question is for Hamza. Oh, yes. And, uh, my question is, I just want to clear something up before I go on. Do you think that logic and science are two separate paths to truth? Because Professor Krauss here is taking the scientific approach, you've been taking the logic approach. Do you believe they're mutually exclusive, that no, you can have a logical... No, of course not, because you can have a deductive yeah. argument that its premises rest on induction. So that's fine. And an inductive argument, by definition, is empirical by nature. But the point I'm trying to say is, there is a difference between induction and deduction. That is a clear distinction. Well, sure. That's which, yeah, exactly. So the point is, if we do have a valid and sound deductive argument, then for God's sake, let's address it. 
Uh, not to say, oh, you guys put women in bags, or you, you scratch your ear on a Sunday, or you don't clean your earwax, or all these kind of random red herrings that were coming along, right? I cannot, I, no, no, so I'm the, sorry, the point I is, to ask empirically, what's, to me, and maybe this uh, is a different word, interrupt? maybe we should have defined the word sensible. Uh, please, yeah, sorry, sensible, um, could, I, is, I, could I interrupt? Is, is something yeah, that's sorry, that, 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 that wasn't the question. My sorry. question was that, uh, uh, if you think logic is, uh, you said you didn't think it was independent, but do you think that your, your premises, because that's what your arguments rest on, are informed by empirical evidence? Uh, there, there's, some of them are supported, but, but the majority of them are deductive themselves. Okay, next question. And that's what makes deductive very strong. If you have premises that are deductive and the conclusion is sound and valid, therefore it's a deductive argument. So that makes it a very strong argument. And that's why I said it would be irrational to take induction over deduction if you have a deductive argument. How do you know that they're valid if you don't test them? Because you know them conceptually and metaphysically and philosophically. <laughs> Just like that woman knew to drown her four kids. Yeah, but, okay. okay. No, no, no. Okay. Can no, no, no. Let, let me address this question. I'm sorry. The, the interesting thing is your very statement is a metaphysical statement. It could be translated metaphysically. For example, induction is the only way the only method to use to try and establish or know reality. That statement itself is self-defeating. It can't even be proven by, its, by, by, by empiricism. It's an inductive statement. So the point is, I give an example. It's like, it's like you All have almost, it's like you have this almost crude. Know, I don't claim to know what's valid just by knowing it. No but, you, but, no, but you have to in that very statement in itself because you're, it's almost like you're presenting this crude scientism or logical positivism. Oh, that's stop using words. Talk okay, to me well, in English. Okay. Oh, but when you use words, it's great. When I use words, I can't do no, that. I don't, yeah? I don't think I've used very much jargon at all. If I did, I apologize. Okay, scientism is, let me define it for you. It is the assertion that science is the only way to form conclusions about reality. Okay? That statement itself is one, self-defeating, because science can't prove that statement. Secondly, science itself, that statement itself, is, is, is flawed because science can't prove mathematical truths. Also, it can't prove ontological truths. It can't prove moral truths. Historical truths. Well, if you study you know epistemology, sorry, Hold on, how do excuse you know me, it can't sir. Prove historical truths. Let, 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 me, let me make a point, sir. How do you know it can't prove moral truths? So you're making these Okay, okay. Let me make my point. How do we know Aristotle existed? There's lots of evidence. Okay. Let me let me give you a piece of evidence that I know. We know him through Plato. Okay. Yeah, that it's highly likely that he yeah, existed. Which okay. Is what science would say. Yeah, but let me make my point. Even anyone studying epistemology, which is the study of knowledge and belief, yeah. you would know that the majority of your opinions in this room as well is based on non-empirical evidence. It's you're based right, on. But the let me finish. Like I understand that could be wrong. Yeah, but Aristotle I, may not have existed. Yeah, but you're missing a point. I'm trying to show you there's other routes to knowledge, sir, which That's is not knowledge. such as so testimony, for example, oh, authentic testimony. and valid testimony. Oh my goodness, you really believe in testimony as proof of? Uh, of do you really believe that? But, but Professor Krauss, the you whole... Really just, do you really believe that because let, I say... Let's not dig a hole for ourselves. Someone did something, it happened? Go to the Berkeley website on the scientific method. It says one of the majority aspects... I don't aspects go to websites, I just do science. Yeah, okay, well, it's very, that's very great. Well, do this science then. Listen to this science. The Berkeley website says the key part of the scientific method is, is also the workings of other scientists that you, you test and you don't trust yeah. and you repeat their experiments because you don't trust yes results. i agree That's wait the way wait wait works. but there's a lot of science you don't trust other people's results excuse me sir there's a lot of science that requires testimony yeah what lots of science what okay i'll give you an example have you done every single experiment concerning evolution no so you believe it's true thank you, you very know, much i don't know what else do you want to say do you want to, do you want, do you want me to answer do you want me to answer? Yeah. Do you want to answer questions? Of course I do. Of course I do. You, you, you gave an answer before I even answered it. Come oh, on. Okay. You're accusing me of <coughs> things I did. Yeah, no, I'm, 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 I'm learning from anything. the best. I told you, <laughs> I don't believe in anything. I think, based on the evidence of my experience, yes, and everything I see in the world around me, that evolution is highly likely. Okay. And that's what I would call a fact. So, we, so, so, so when you had an interview... Un, un, unbelievably um, highly likely. Oh, as, okay. As highly likely as the... I, even though I haven't, I haven't ever been in space, although I wouldn't mind. Uh, look, I believe, I in, I, I, the, I, I believe uh, in gender uh, equality. The, and a, the, what, the only woman who wants to answer a question in the room right now, oh, she's standing there. I Let's agree. do it. Okay. <laughs> I applaud that. I applaud you for that. I just wanted to make a comment about um, the incident that happened before this event began. Um, I acknowledge that the brother who couldn't find a seat where he was coming from, um, but I, and I believe that he has a right to sit where he wanted to, but there has been some misunderstanding. 
Um, firstly, Islam makes it very clear that um, equality is incredibly important and that no black man, for example, is superior to a white man and vice versa. But the issue here was not one of superiority as no one imposed segregation upon him. He was allowed to sit with the ladies at the back and he was also allowed to sit at the front with females. But if some of us, okay, if some of the I ladies chosen to sit at a distance from the men, why must he impose himself upon us? If I sat in a restaurant with my friends away from men, would it be appropriate for him to join me at my table too? And I'm basically offended by his disrespect for my values. Okay. Let me, res let me respond, although I'm not the organizers. Let me respond, look, the point is, a as I said, I don't think sh people should be uncomfortable, okay? And, uh, and they should move if they're uncomfortable. However, however, you chose to come to an event that wasn't segregated. If you felt uncomfortable by that, I think you have the right not to be here and watch it on video. But you chose to do that, and therefore, it, you know, un I, I, and I realize that you may be uncomfortable seeing the men, and I respect that. You shouldn't be forced to do that. But if you choose to go to a hockey game or a or a what do they call it here football game, which is really soccer, um, uh, uh, then you 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 know you subject yourself to the social conventions of of, of the time. So I'm I, I respect your desires, and I don't want you to be forced to do that. And in fact, you should have moved away if it was offensive. Or, uh, but but the point is that this was a non-segregated event and you knew that coming in and you therefore were subject to the possibility that you might be near someone and, I, and, and that was your choice. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, thank you very much. You guys, mashallah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh. Don't be sorry. I've I don't been sitting on the fence the whole night, you see. It doesn't, um, it doesn't Okay, me. it's painful sitting on fences. Um, Hamza I've and Professor Krauss, you know, I think you guys have been amazing tonight. Don't you think? I don't think so. But you, but you still got to convince the audience up there, so you've got two minutes each. Oh, well, no, I mean, I, I, I'm glad we had more dialogue than, I mean, as I once said, because I, I just think the debate format is a stupid format, I'm, for, forgive me. Uh, it, it, it just doesn't lead to the kind of interaction. Actually, there's been some positives that have come out of the fact when Hamza and I have talked that have been much more positive than when people make these rhetorical long yeah. statements and trying to find things and try and sneak the other person into some logical contradiction. It's just, it's just not good for, for education. My intent, and I'm sure I've offended people here, my intent was not to offend. I always offend, and I offend some of my scientific colleagues too. My intent was just to raise questions and encourage people to think about issues. And for that, I hope, I've, I hope to, that some of the statements I've made will cause people to think. And, you're, and indeed, my whole point is that given access to information, and I believe you should get access to information about the world really works, which is why I write scientific books and I speak, because I think these are some of those beautiful ideas people have ever come up with. That we shouldn't be afraid of them, we shouldn't fear them, we shouldn't view them as if, in fact, if they offend our beliefs, that's a good thing, because it means our beliefs are wrong. And that, as I say to students all the time, is the greatest gift we can have. Changing our minds and learning is what's produced the progress that allows this room to happen, that allows these video cameras to be recording things. So I just hope that as I hope I am willing to change my beliefs or change my mind in the presence of evidence and get information, that I hope that some of the things I've said have spurred your thinking and I certainly don't want to convert you into anything. And so thank you for listening. Hamza. Oh dear. You know what, so, something inside me thought, I knew it would be like this, because when I watch Professor Krauss, although I disagree with him, I love his style. And my dad would love your style as well. It's like, I don't care, I'm going to be me, get over it. You know? So <laughs> I do respect that, I do respect that. Good. And the other thing well, I do respect... that way too, don't you think? Yes, we're the same. Okay, well, then you're the go. same. Then that's, that's why you what, love That's why there was like almost an explosion here on atomic levels. Yeah? Yeah. I mean, interestingly, 
we have a lot in common. We both like Star Trek. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I, I know it's not real. Yeah, I, I give him that one. I give him that one. I give him that one. Okay, good. Right. So, first and foremost, I think there wasn't much discussion on the definition of a miracle that I presented. I think maybe we should have more useful discussion on maybe the, the coherent definition that we presented. Uh, concerning the literary form is unique. Again, I think there was a misunderstanding between aesthetic reception and unique literary form. And the computer analysis that was brought as an example wasn't based on a whole chapter, which is based on the inimitability of the Quranic discourse. Also, I think we, we brought forth a deductive argument to show that the finitude of the universe, and therefore it couldn't have come via nothing, once it was in a state of non-existence and it, then it was brought into being, it couldn't self-create, it couldn't be created by something else that was created because of the absurdity of the infinite regress. Therefore, it, it, it makes sense that it was created by something uncreated or caused by something that's uncaused. And it's in line with our definition of causality, which is something that produces effect, which allows asymmetric causality. Also, when we talked about the infinite, we talked about the quantitative infinite, the, not the qualitative infinite. And I think the examples the professor gave were based on axioms and conventions in the mathematical realm of discourse rather than in reality. So that's what I have to say. I don't think the key premises of my argument were addressed. And I think it shows the veracity of Islam from that perspective because if it was so wrong and so rubbish and so nonsensical, we would have had a strong counter argument from that perspective. But this is going to be unaddressed until the day of judgment, I believe. But I think what we all have to learn is that, you know what? We can sit on a table. We can speak together. We may be angry and rhetorical. And by the way, I so apologize if I offended anyone, especially Professor Krauss. I did say things that I shouldn't have said for a highly respected, yeah, for a highly respected academic like himself. So we have to humble ourselves for his achievements. And some of the words I used were not appropriate, even though they may have sounded nice rhetorically, but that's a different <laughs> issue. Um, the point is, you know, at the end of the day, let's be human. Let's connect with one another each other without presuppositions. And that's very hard to do. But the only way to do that is just really divorcing our drama and our presuppositions when we try to engage with someone. And that's what we teach in our courses all the time. Engage with a human being, not, with his, not just with his beliefs or your perception of who he is. We didn't quite get there today, but you know what? It's the beginning. God bless you all. Oh, this is a baby. Oh, when